everyone. <laughs> I think I'm on now. <laughs> um, but welcome to the Data Thread Conference. My name is Marlene, and I am a developer advocate here at Voltron Data. And I'm also a, a Python programmer. If you would like to follow me on Twitter and just find out more about random things you can do with Python, feel free to. My uh, handle is Marlene underscore ZW. And I'm so excited that you have decided to join us today for the conference. For those of you who aren't really sure what this conference is about, the Data Thread is an event highlighting Apache Arrow and the Arrow community around the world. And this is actually the inaugural version of this event. So congratulations to everyone here on being a pioneer in this space. Um, and we have so many community members of the Apache Arrow community here with us today, representing different programming languages, different projects, and even different countries. I'm actually calling you today from Harare, Zimbabwe, uh, of which Zimbabwe is a country in the southern part of Africa for anyone that hasn't heard of it. <laughs> but I think this event is, uh, I'd like to think of it as a very sort of global and open and language agnostic event, which is very appropriate considering all of these things are a really key part of the Apache Arrow uh, philosophy in general. So regardless of where you are watching this conference from or whichever programming language you code in or don't code in at all, um, you are a very welcome member of the Arrow community. So welcome to the data thread. <laughs> um, so moving forward onto a bit more information about our uh, session today. Um, today's conference is divided into into two different segments. We have a series of live sessions that uh, you are actually attending the live sessions right now. And uh, after the live sessions, we also have a range of pre-recorded talks, which you will get access to immediately after um, these live sessions. Uh, for the live sessions, we'll be starting off with a keynote from Wes McKinney and Jacques Nudeau, who are the co-creators of Apache Arrow. Very excited to hear from them about the different innovations that are happening across the Arrow ecosystem. We'll also be having a panel session on high performance com computing and getting to see how Arrow is being used in that space. Um, I'm also very excited for the Python community because we will have a fireside chat with the CEO of Anaconda, Peter Wang, and the CEO of Voltron Data, Joshua Patterson. Um, so please stay tuned for that. We have a range, a number of other featured speakers that are going to be joining us during this live session that I won't list all of them just because this is a bit of an introduction. And uh, if you do want to know the specifics of which live speakers are going to be speaking, go ahead and visit thedatathread.com for more information on that. And to end off the live sessions today, we will have a live Q&A uh, segment where you can answer, you can ask questions uh, to the featured speakers. In fact, if you are watching any of the talks or the panel sessions and you have a specific uh, question for a speaker, please note that down and put it into the chat and we will hopefully get that question up to one of the speakers uh, during that segment. And like I mentioned earlier, we have over 30 pre-recorded talks that are gonna be available on demand through the Voltron Data YouTube channel. And everyone that has registered for this conference, you will, you should have, or you will uh, receive a link to the Voltron YouTube page. And the pre-recorded talks are, that is going to give you, that link actually that you get will give you early access to be able to watch the pre-recorded talks. Um, which will only be publicly available in the next few days. So make sure if you want to watch the talks on the YouTube channel that you're using the link that you have received. Um, and if you haven't received a link, just I think just wait till the end of the live sessions or uh, check, check back with us at the end of, 
of this session as well, and I will let you know what to do then. Um, <laughs> so for our pre-recorded talks, I just want to give you a brief um, summary of what you can expect. Um, you can expect to hear uh, new and exciting developments in the Arrow ecosystem, including updates on flight SQL, substrate, and skyhook. Um, we'll also have ex experts from uh, different uh, Arrow-based frameworks like Velox and Torch Arrow sharing updates on what uh, they've been working on for their specific uh, frameworks. Uh, you can also expect to see me <laughs> giving a pre-recorded talk along with other engineers and committers who are working on language specific implementations of Apache Arrow. I'll be talking about Pi Arrow and uh, IBIS, which are all projects around the Python ecosystem, but we also have uh, talks on uh, implementations of R, Rust, Julia, JavaScript, and and go. So if you are interested in a specific language, just go ahead and search that. I think they will be in playlists. So you can actually just, just kind of binge watch based off of your language of preference. And um, yeah, so hopefully if anyone as well who is interested in the commercial aspect of Arrow and what Arrow is being used for in that where you can also be able to find some talks that are specifically about how Arrow is being used in industry. So that is pretty much what I have for you to introduce this conference. I'm so glad that you've decided to be with us today. Um, our live sessions are going to be running from 12 p.m. EDT all the way up to 3 p.m. EDT as well. So please try and stay tuned for the uh, for all of the sessions. Um, we're going to get started with our keynote and I'm just going to do a quick introduction of our keynote speakers. Um, so Jacques Nudeau is the CEO and co-founder of Sundic, which is a company focusing on enhancing existing um, on enhancing existing cloud data warehouses. He is the previous CTO and co-founder of Dremio. Jacques is the co-creator and founding PMC chair of Apache Arrow, like I mentioned earlier. Um, Jacques, was going, Jacques is going to be joined by Wes McKinney, who is the CTO and co-founder of Voltron Data. And Wes is a software engineer and entrepreneur focusing on analytical computing. He created the very famous Pandas library for anyone that uses pandas, he created it, <laughs> and is also the co-creator of Apache Arrow. So welcome to Jacques and Wiz as they talk to us and introduce the conference. So, so Jacques and I are, are, are speaking here together um, on this talk. And what we wanted to do was to give a, uh, to give a retrospective on the formation of, of the Arrow project and the kinds of problems that we were thinking about when we when we started uh, when we started the project, and talk about how we have approached uh, developing and growing the community over over these last uh, six six to seven years, um, and then talking and toward the end of the talk about some of our predictions and and hopes for you know for the future of Apache Arrow, as well as uh, as well as other projects that are in in the Arrow orbit that will help continue to drive innovation. Um, in the modern in the modern data stack. So, uh, well, Marlene just uh, just introduced us, um, but uh, you know, very briefly, um, you know, I'm uh, a co-founder of Voltron Data. Uh, we are an enterprise software company, um, you know, building accelerated computing technologies for the Apache Arrow ecosystem. I've worked on a variety of other other projects uh, over the years, but uh, Arrow has been my primary focus since uh, since 2015, uh, 20, 2016. Um, and before we dive into Arrow, uh, into Arrow matters, uh, Jacques, uh, if you want to say say a little bit about uh, you know what you're focused on uh, focused on on nowadays. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, Wes, and thanks, Marlene. Um, yeah, so as uh, as Marlene mentioned, uh, started a new company called Sundeck. We're very young. Um, but really trying to continue this, this agenda that I think Wes and I both have, which is driving forward uh, the um, democratization of, of different levels of sort of um, analytical technology to make it much more available to a broader group of users. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, been very involved with Arrow since the beginning, um, uh, actually working on sort of the precursor to that, 
um, in another open source project prior to, to Arrow being created. Um, more recently in the open source, I've been um, working very hard with uh, Wes and others on a project called Substrate, which everybody should go check out, um, which is really, I think of it as a sibling project to Arrow, much more focused on um, sort of how you express your computation and what you want to compute, um, as opposed to Arrow, which is much more about expressing what is the data uh, that you're working with. Um, so uh, very much complementary to that and along this sort of same pattern of basically decomposition of databases. Awesome. Let's um, move on to the next slide. So, <clears throat> so I want to go back, go back in time to, uh, to 2000, 2015. So I first, I first met Jacques um, in, I think it was around June, 2015. So it's been, it's been about seven years ago. And we, we both had very different paths and in terms of the projects that we worked on, how we ended up interested in the problem that, that became, um, that, that became Arrow. So I wanted to, you know, just talk, talk a little bit about, you know, my own personal journey and let, let Jacques talk about his journey and how he ended up in thinking about, uh, you know, thinking about Arrow and deciding to build, uh, deciding to build this project. Um, you know, many of you know, I came from the, the, the data science ecosystem. I had been working for uh, the, the previous seven years or so in primarily on the, on the Pandas project, uh, which, which, which started in 2000, 2008. And then I had a, a startup called, called Datapad that was acquired by Cloudera in 2014. And, um, you know, during, that, during that, that period, I had really experienced a lot of pain associated with uh, working with large data sets in Python, dealing with memory issues, running out of memory, having to having a lot of development burden, building custom implementations of query processing, analytics, data serialization, reading all the different file formats and accessing all the different databases um, that are necessary to be able to do productive data science in, in Python. And when I landed at, at Cloudera in 2000, 2014, I was really interested in building a bridge between the Python ecosystem and, and uh, the data science world and the big data ecosystem, which was really Java, uh, Java dominated at that, you know, at that point in time. Um, so I started working with the, the folks who had worked on um, Impala, Kudu, and Parquet um, at, at Cloudera. That's also where I started building the, the IBIS project to build a better data frame interface to interact with these different big data systems. Um, but there was this, this problem of, of, of data and, and connectivity between programming languages and systems. And so, you know, that's how I got interested in this problem uh, and what led me to, you know, work to assemble some of my colleagues to, uh, you know, to start a project and then start looking for collaborators outside of, uh, of Cloudera that we could work with to make it successful. Yeah, and on my side, it was an interesting experience because, um, you know, uh, part of what's interesting about Arrow is, is the construction of, uh, of an open source community and the dynamics around that. And in many ways, some of the precursors for me from before Arrow were about the same dynamic. And so early on, it was a company called MapR that was in the Hadoop space. Um, and they were really interested in trying to build a new um, open source query engine or distributed sort of MPP for, for, for big data. And um, when I sat down and started to think about that problem and, and how you approach the construction of an open source project, um, I realized there was kind of this tension. Um, and so on the one hand, the vast majority of, uh, of people who were involved in these open source projects were Java developers. Um, and on the other hand, um, it didn't make a lot of sense to build a database in Java. Um, sure, you can do it, like you can do it in any language, um, but it wasn't necessarily the most logical place to build a database. Um, and so it was this kind of balancing act, which is like, well, um, how quickly can you build an open source project in, in big data um, in, in, in something like C++? Uh, REST wasn't really uh, a big thing then. Um, uh, and I was like, okay, well, it makes a lot of sense to build something in Java, um, but we also have this interest to um, make sure that we have basically a, a relief valve um, and can do stuff at a, a lower level um, when we get to um, very close to the data and we start wanting to process stuff very close to the data. And so one of the um, sort of compromises that we chose to make in that project early on was to say, hey, let's um, build the, uh, the model for um, sort of management of your computing um, in Java, um, but let's write the, um, the actual processing of data um, as more of a language agnostic pattern. And that was something we called value vectors. 
Um, and that was kind of the precursor to, um, uh, in many ways, to some of the stuff we did in Arrow. And what happened was, is that um, as I started working with this data structure, the, these, these, what effectively became Arrow data structures, it became very clear that um, it took a different way of thinking about how to do these things. And it was something that also felt like it's something that many people um, were either struggling with now or were going to struggle with in the future. Um, and whenever I look at a situation where there's basically a common set of pains um, and something that is probably not as um, a core to a differentiation of a particular sort of product, um, then that's a good opportunity to try to do something open source. And so about the time I started thinking about like, hey, is there a way to develop this with the sort of a broader community? Um, uh, I, started, I started chatting with uh, Julian, who was working on the Parquet stuff. Um, Julian connected uh, Wes and myself because we were kind of both sniffing around that same space. And that's really how we got into the room and said, hey, let's start having a conversation about what this could be. And that was, you know, I think that the timeline is, as you said, like it's June of 15. Um, and I think that it was uh, right about January of 16 where we actually formalized that's the right. project. Yeah, that's right. And I think like one of the, I think one of the interesting, like early, you know, early challenges as we rallied, um, you know, I think it ended up being 13 different open source projects and, you know, 20 some developers signing on to, to start and kick off, kick off the arrow project is that it was this idea that seemed so obvious to people. They said, you know, well, 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 of course we should have uh, a universal uh, columnar data format for, for in memory where we can move data across programming languages and at, you know, boundaries between computing engines uh, without having to do expensive data conversions uh, and things like that. And so the problem was like so, so simple and obvious, but yet the, the, it gave people this like feeling of, well, like, well, why don't we have that already if it's so obvious? And so I think there's often this problem in, in open source software and in computing in general that some of the problems that seem really simple on the surface are actually actually very difficult once you start, um, you know, once you start getting into the um, into the details. And I think with this group of people, what what helped make it succeed was that there was this prior kind of connection from having having worked on uh, developing the Parquet file format. Um, so, like you know, Parquet was becoming really successful. It was be, had become the preferred file format for for Apache Spark. Um, it was co-developed, you know, in the early 2010s by engineers from Twitter and uh, Twitter and Cloudera and, and others. And so there was this like pre-existing relationship from having, you know, developed something with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of low level details around file format and data encoding and so forth. But there was also like a, a feeling that everybody understood how open source projects should work and as well as like being able to learn from the past, you know, good and bad experiences uh, from from their other open source projects and their other pro and their other project communities. Um, but I think also it was, yeah, I think another interesting aspect was that so many of the people in the room worked for competing companies. We had engineers from Mapbar, Cloudera, Hortonworks, um, you know, all you know, basically sworn companies that are sworn en enemies of each other at that time. Um, but yet we were able to, you know, form this basis of collaboration around, you know, solving the, the, this critical, uh, this, this critical technology problem that we were all, uh, that we were all facing. Yeah. And I think that that was, um, I mean, to me, it's like one of the, the key things that we can find in open source is these opportunities for engineers to collaborate um, in places where businesses clearly couldn't do partnerships. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things um, has, as Wes mentioned, one of the key things that I think we were thinking about early on is, is that um, I really kind of, from my experience, there's kind of two different kinds of open source projects that exist in the world. Or maybe there's at least two, I guess. Um, uh, one of those types of projects is, um, is something that we saw a lot, especially in the big data world, um, which was um, what I would describe as sort of a commercialization of the Apache brand, um, where a single organization creates an open source project um, open source in name, um, but really the primary uh, amount of contribution and, and development is being done um, at one company. Uh, and we've seen this a lot, right? Like I think a lot of the projects on this on this slide actually suffered from that challenge. Um, I think you know one of the things when we early on was thinking about like, hey, how Calcite had actually done a really good job 
uh, being uh, much more of a Switzerland where many different organizations that come together and work. And so when we were thinking about how we compose that early group of people, it was uh, you know, a very deliberate choice to say, hey, let's get people together that, um, that are, have different sort of you know, company backgrounds. Um, because what we want is we actually want something that's very much a consensus driven project as to vote, as opposed to what we see sometimes in open source, which is much more of a, um, a commercial driven, um, project. So I think, you know, one of the, uh, technology trends that we were all experiencing, you know, at that time was that we were, we were seeing, um, storage and networking getting exponentially, exponentially faster. Um, and at the same time, you know, Moore's law was slowing down. So CPUs, CPUs weren't getting uh, twice as fast every, every two or three years, or I, f I forget the exact, every 18 months, you know, the exact formulation of, of Moore's law. And so we were seeing systems that had historically been IO bound starting to become, starting to become CPU bound. And so, and if you look at, you know, profile these workloads and you say, wow, like, these systems, um, you know, not only is there a problem of how the data is arranged, so we can arrange the data better so that it can be better suited for uh, for modern modern processors, but we also have to spend a great deal less time converting data between one format and another. And so, you know, that was really the the crux of you know why we decided to do this was that we needed this this technology which could serve not only to to better utilize uh, modern com modern computing hardware. Uh, but also alleviate the the serialization burden that's causing causing this um, CPU uh, CPU bottleneck. Uh, now that you know networking and disk drive performance, you know throughput and latency is no longer uh, the the problem that it the problem that it once was. Yeah, and I think that you know one of the really interesting things that I sort of um, think about when I think about what happened there, and sort of just even dynamics around adoption of an open source technology. Um, uh, you know, Wes and I, I think, always share this vision of Arrow as a, a modern way to work with data in memory and, and really to accelerate compute. Um, um, but it's kind of a big pill to swallow if you've already got a system that's in place that has a particular in-memory format for how it works with data. Um, uh, and then a bunch of code that's customized for that representation of data, um, it becomes relatively difficult to say, okay, I'm going to refactor my entire system to, to work with this new format. And so one of the things that we, I think we figured out um, and sort of did well was this idea that you can actually, um, if you think about um, Arrow as initially as a transport format, um, then there's a lot of use that people can have, even if they're not at, at the early stages willing to um, move their internal uh, compute capabilities um, to the error representation. And so that was always one of the things I think I heard from sort of especially database um, creators early on. And so like, well, that's an internal concern. We would never use an external technology for that or a shared technology. Um, and I think that that was true for people who had already built their systems. Um, but the, um, what happened with them was is that they generally adopted it more as a transport format. Um, but you know, what we hope to have happen, and I think actually has happened, is, is that um, as new systems are created, we've now created a large enough set of tools and toolkits um, that people would actually build on top of this um, rather than thinking about it as an external concern. And so it was this, if you think about transport, especially as a challenge, there's this question of like, how do you solve transport? How do you avoid serialization? And the conclusion we came to was, is the way you avoid serialization is, is that you actually don't focus on the transport format, you focus on the um, compute format because the compute format is the thing people are gonna optimize. And then if that's not transportable, then you're gonna always have to pay a serialization. Um, and so to us, it was like, oh, all of a sudden, like it's these two things actually need to be coupled um, and, and use the same representation, but it should be compute first because you're never gonna be able to convince someone to use uh, a data representation that's optimized for transport um, to do compute operations because those computer operations are gonna be very inefficient and everybody's always looking for more performance, especially in analytics. Absolutely. Um, I think a, an adjacent problem that, that was really important to me when we were starting this was, was the problem of connecting the data science ecosystem to, to the data lakes, which are largely managed by um, you know, JVM big data systems. So data, data warehouses, Apache Spark, uh, Presto, things like that. And so, you know, that ended up being like one of the compelling like killer apps for, for Arrow early on was helping Python and R programmers um, access the data that's being, you know, dumped into S3, uh, the Parquet files and things like, you know, and things like that. And so, uh, you know, so we invested a great deal in that early on to, to simplify, to not only accelerate data access, but also simplify it so that, 
you know, when you're going to, to access data in your company's, you know, data lake in, in the cloud, um, that you have this single optimized fast path uh, through, through Arrow. Um, and that, that also, you know, adds, adds more value to the, uh, the arrow based computing tools that, that are, you know, starting to be starting to be developed in the last, um, in the last couple of years. Um, so I want to change, you know, change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about how, how we funded and supported the development, um, you know, of this project. So it's an open source. It's not simply enough to have, uh, you know, a good idea and, uh, and put some elbow grease into it. Like the work, um, the work has to be, uh, the work has to be paid for, um, you know, many, um, you know, often companies contribute to open source projects because it's solving a problem that's in their, um, you know, that's in their self-interest, but there's tons and tons of unglamorous work that, you know, that has to be, uh, has to be done to grow uh, a large and, uh, a, a large, uh, a kind of far reaching, um, you know, far reaching open source project. And, uh, you know, we've done that through, you know, a variety of different ways. And, and I think that, I think the different ways that we've, that we've, you know, funded and supported aero development has also been, um, you know, a source of its success. Uh, while at the same time, like we, you know, we, there were no aero companies, uh, really for, for, for the longest time. I think, um, you know, I think Voltron data is probably the first company that qualifies as an aero company. Um, whereas, you know, everyone else, you know, who's been contributing, uh, you know, contributing to the project, uh, has been doing so because, you know, there's a, um, you know, there's a give and take of like, there's, there's benefits derived from more people adopting, adopting arrow. Um, but you know, like the first truly aero native company was, was Dremio. And so like to have, um, you know, to have like a distributed, you know, distributed SQL engine, um, you know, Aero Native from the ground up was a huge, uh, you know, um, it was a huge data point that helped people feel confident, you know, betting on the on the ecosystem. Yeah, I think that like, um, I think you're being uh, overly modest uh, in terms of your own uh, sort of role in in the in in the, the success of the project. Um, but I think it comes down to something that I think you know is 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 very critical for open source in general is is that. Um, part of what makes open source, I think, the most successful open source projects is a, willy, a willingness to share ownership. Um, you know, especially developers, we often kind of feel um, like we kind of own our code and like it's, it's, it's our stuff. Um, and I think that the challenge with that is, is if you're trying to build a community, what you want to do is have a lot more people come in and contribute to that community. Um, and so you need to give them um, the opportunity to have their own ownership of the project. Um, and I think that, you know, there's actually some really, uh, you know, lucky things that happened in the project early on, right? So as an example of this, you know, um, uh, on, the, on the Dremio side, we've been working a lot in Java. Um, and so that worked really well um, on our side. And then Wes on, Wes on the other side, um, you know, I don't know if he hates Java, um, but I don't think it's his favorite language. Um, and, and so um, so he was very passionate on trying to get access to the stuff that was in these Java platforms uh, and make it more and, and sort of more readily available to um, other languages like Python or C++. Um, and so it was one of those things where like, because we defined Arrow as something that was um, language agnostic, it allowed us each to, each to have um, some impact in the project and have, you know, a, 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 a space to have um, sort of um, that ownership, um, but also giving the others um, uh, the ability to have ownership as well. And that's actually at the end is continued through the process over time um, is, is that um, because you have people who work in, uh, and enjoy different languages, um, there was often an opportunity for those people to um, play a very big role very quickly in the project um, and really have their own ownership of owning a, a particular sub portion of the total ecosystem. Definitely. Um... I think uh, you know what one. I think one aspect of this that that I wanted to talk a little bit about and also get your you know your perspective on is that I feel like there were these critical early adopters and and use cases. Um, you know the folks who really bought into the arrow to the arrow vision and and worked with us to uh, to make uh, to make the applications make the applications successful. That I think without them, uh, you know, we'd be looking at a you know very different uh, you know very different state of the world. You know, very different state of the world right now. So, you know, I mentioned that you know having having Arrow building, you know, uh, having Dremio building an Arrow native, uh, you know, distributed engine in Java, um, and then building some of the other supporting technologies like expression compilation uh, with LLVM. You know, proving out the the cross kind of 
uh, cross library interoperability between the JVM and, and non JVM, you know, native code, I think was a big deal. Um, you know, for me, like the biggest lifeline was, um, you know, the two biggest lifelines early on were, were two Sigma and, and our studio. So early on, you know, I connected with two Sigma, two Sigma financial technology company in New York. And, um, and, you know, they said, uh, you know, we really, we really, uh, want to, to make Python run better on, on Apache Spark. And so everyone, you know, knew that you could use Python with Spark, but you would pay this massive performance penalty, uh, versus using the Scala or Java API. And so, you know, we banded together and we, we found some collaborators at IBM and we, we worked and within a year of, you know, Arrow starting, we had, uh, you know, we had built the Arrow Spark integration that made, um, that made PySpark, you know, an order of magnitude or even a hundred times faster in, in certain cases. And so I think that was, you know, one of these things where it really, it, it made Python a lot more relevant for Spark users because they, they, you know, it made just, you know, getting data in and out of Spark and running custom Python code significantly more efficient. Um, but, you know, it wasn't until, you know, 2018, um, you know, I needed more, you know, more funding. I wanted to build a larger team of, of developers to, to build and support, you know, the Arrow community that, um, you know, I connected with our studio and we, we found this, you know, partnership. We, we founded this partnership called Ursa Labs um, and got, you know, funding from, from two Sigma and from, from NVIDIA and a lot of other companies so that we could build out, build out a team and have, and be hundred percent focused on, uh, developing arrow for data science use cases and growing, uh, and growing the ecosystem. Um, you know, another thing that was, you know, um, you know, that was happening alongside, you know, alongside arrow was GPU acceleration for, for analytics, for analytics with arrow. So I, I learned, um, you know, about a year into the Arrow project that that NVIDIA was interested in investing in data analytics on NVIDIA hardware, and um, so so we worked to forge, you know, a collaboration and and to uh, to work for the betterment of of these of these ecosystems, and that's where the the Rapids project came from, and and that you know proving out that you can do hardware accelerated SQL processing data analytics uh, on graphics cards. You know, it was just an amazing, you know, kind of uh, validation for for the Arrow project and for for the future. You know, paving you know paving the road for the for the future of the ecosystem and how we can how we can lower computing costs uh, through through accelerated query processing. And I think the other thing that I think is useful to mention here as people sort of work on stuff is is that um, you know uh, nothing's ever easy. Um, and so one of the things I, I, I think back as as Wes was talking about you know working um, to to get integration to Spark. Um, is, is, is that, that was, a, it was actually not a, a, an easy or done deal, right? There was actually a massive amount of work over a couple of year period of, of, of Holden Corral and, and Brian Cutler and others at IBM really trying to push this into Spark. Um, and I wouldn't say that there was uh, conflict around it, but it was definitely not like something that was, uh, that was, um, uh, it was definitely controversial for many. Um, and so these things that seem like they're, you know, totally obvious, of course, this should work with that and, and whatnot um, can actually be relatively political in, in even open source communities. Um, because as I mentioned, different people think that, um, you know, they have certain ownership over different kinds of things. And so, um, yeah, I, I think about, you know, that, 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 that spark thing was a boon, right. There was early, you know, early blog posts. I think West did that were like, you know, 70 X improvement in performance. Um, and it's, you know, it catches eyes and it was true, right. It was an engineering benchmark, not a marketing benchmark. Um, but yeah, it was super helpful for these different organizations. You know, I was working and I was co-founder of Dremio, working there and trying to push things along from one perspective. And um, Wes was also pushing it along from another perspective. Um, yeah. And I actually have said before that I think that in some ways, Arrow was early. Um, uh, initially, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a challenging activity to convince people um, to use it. Um, in the first few years, if you actually look at the the consumption, the stars, the downloads, or whatever metric you want to look at, uh, in the first couple of years, there wasn't a lot of engagement. Um, uh, and so we were ahead of the market, but we really, really believed in that. And I think that, you know, uh, in, in the large part, because of Wes's um, huge amounts of personal compromise and sacrifice, we were able to get to someplace very, very um, unique. So another another thing that we've you know 
uh, we've had to navigate as the project, you know, project de has developed is, you know, becoming more than just another file format. And it's, it's amazing the number of people that I, you know, that I talk to about Arrow and, uh, you know, they, uh, I talk about, you know, how big the community has gotten and how, how diverse and, and, uh, you know, just the sheer numbers of people that are contributing. We're pretty I'm close to I'm having a thousand, uh, a thousand unique contributors, like different humans that have contributed to, uh, you know, to Apache Arrow. And so we have to explain, you know, how the project, you know, has developed, you know, beyond being, um, you know, just a, an interoperability or interchange, interchange format. And from the early days in Arrow, we had this, this concept of the, of the deconstructed database. Like if you look at all of the subsystems um, of an analytic database system, you obviously the memory format and, and what you develop your algorithms against is an important part, but then there's all of these other critical subsystems that, that are necessary um, to build a, you know, distributed computing engine. And so, you know, we, we did have, you know, back in 2015, we had the aspiration to, um, to, to build all of these things to support connectivity, you know, better database connectivity, better distributed system connectivity, creating compute primitives, uh, you know, embeddable execution engines, expression compilation. And bit by bit, we've been building, we've been building all of these, all of these things. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, of course, like we had to, we had to harden the memory format first because all of the other things were highly dependent, um, highly dependent on that. Uh, but it's been exciting to see the the work and the community shift to these connectivity and in-memory computing initiatives that are more, you know, focused on consolidating, uh, you know, consolidating the effort around, you know, high performance query processing uh, and high performance, you know, connectivity and creating more arrow connected systems. Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, there's some really amazing things here. Like I think the first thing I, and I, I you know, I, like, I didn't even fully appreciate this until I went back and actually looked at it because we've gone, you know, early on with any of these projects, you go through a lot of different iteration and, and, and honestly, like it was, it was challenging early on because we changed the format a bunch of times in the, in the very beginning. And, and, you know, I was working on Dremio. We had a production, we had a number of production customers in place. Um, and so changing the in-memory format of our engine uh, multiple times was challenging. Um, but what, what actually that the outcome of that was, was great um, because um, since the 1.0 release, the in-memory format itself has not changed at all. Um, and that's really a testament to the amount of work that went into getting that right. And I, mean, I think that, that um, it's, it's um, this kind of thing where it's like, if you build the right foundation to start, um, then it's a lot easier for these other things to be vibrant, right? Um, I think that one of the things that would have been very challenging in the community is that we started to build a lot of these other kinds of components on top of the memory specification when we didn't have a really stable foundation in that specification. It would have been very disruptive and probably frustrated a lot of people um, because they would have been started building something and then all of a sudden, you know, the specification would have changed and they're like, oh, who should I have to rewrite this algorithm or whatnot? Um, uh, and so, yeah, but as, as Wes said, like if you actually go back and look at the original conversations we had before it was even in a project and some of the open source email lists, um, you'll actually see us talking about some of these other things um, and saying, hey, well, that's where we want to get to. Um, but we knew it would take time and we needed to focus on the core to make, make it successful. So shift gears a little bit, and I want to talk about how we've how we've approached uh, growing the uh, growing the community, you know, the, the developer community and 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 user community. Um, and one of the ways, you know, one of the ways um, which you know led to you know some disagreements at times and uh, some you know occasional occasional controversy was that uh, we looked for you know we we looked for um, other projects and developers who were working on. Um, things that were connected with Arrow, but they were working independently. And we looked for opportunities to bring them into the Apache Arrow project and to do the work together uh, in a more, you know, collaborative um, and uh, interconnected, interconnected fashion. And one of the ways that we did this was through um, a pretty large amount of code donations. Um, so the Apache Software Foundation has a has a mechanism for um, for, you know, basically open source projects to, you know, merge together. It's kind of like an open source acquisition, so, so to speak. Um, and this led to, you know, a, a pretty over a period of years, uh, you know, significant increase in, in the diversity of, of technologies represented in the project. Um, you know, we started out really focused on C++, Java, and Python. And, um, you know, through these, these community merges, uh, we were able to, you know, expand the number of programming languages as well as expand, 
the types of uh, types of software that was being developed in the project. Um, so, you know, the Rust work got started in 2018, and you know, very quickly there was this interest in building a Rust native, uh, you know, computing engine, Data Fusion, and so that was the first time that the project really expanded into, uh, you know, in, into in-memory, in-memory computing, and being uh, kind of a, a computing, you know, backbone for for uh, future uh, future systems. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, <laughs> Wes. I mean, if you look at there's a pic, there's actually something. There's a very there's a, there's, a, there's a little graph here, and there's one bar that's really really tall. Um, and so I think um, yeah, there was Wes got on a little bit of a melee and and said, hey, you know what? I think there's an opportunity to 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 include a lot of different projects in this, um, and really it created. Uh, what it is today, which is which is this amazing community, um, but it also created an unbelievable amount of work for people in the community, and specifically Wes, who took a lot of that responsibility on himself um, to to get these people in and involved in the community, working in a new paradigm. Um, and you know, one of the things that people don't often think about is build infrastructure and test infrastructure. Um, and Arrow has one of the more complex things that I've ever worked on in terms of test infrastructure. I haven't ever worked on Windows, so I'm sure that's even more complicated. But short of Windows, I think Arrow is up there in terms of the number of different things that have to happen um, to get a, a build of all the different pieces of Arrow. Um, and so props to Wes for, for seeing that as an opportunity to grow the community and then pushing through the pain um, that, 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 that it was um, to actually make that successful. Yeah. But I mean, a big part of, you know, an, an, an ambitious project like this is, is, you know, actively, actively recruiting and creating, creating space for, for new people to new people to come into the project and become, um, become project leaders to drive new initiatives and to have, you know, the support and, and agency that they need to be, uh, to be successful. So for me as an, you know, for me as an open source developer, um, you know, Pandas, like I haven't been actively involved in Pandas development since 2013, but it, for me, it was an enormously good feeling to be able to turn over that project to an organic developer community and know that it's in, know that it's in good hands. And so if we had started the Arrow project with our core group of, you know, 20, 25 um, committee members, and we didn't grow that significantly um, beyond that, um, that would have been a, a huge missed opportunity. But instead, you know, we've grown to a committee of 40 and a committership of 75. Um, and so, and that's, that's led to, you know, the, a, a lot greater bandwidth in terms of, you know, what we can do and our ability to continue to outreach and further, you know, further grow the community. Um, so just to give, you know, my, my perspective on some of the, you know, some of the key people involved that really have helped scale the, you know, community. So, you know, Jacques and I um, were, you know, two of the prime movers that helped, uh, you know, get Arrow started along with, you know, Julian Ladem and uh, in, you know, OG Apache people like Julian Hyde from, from Calcite, who provided a lot of guidance for how we could kind of shape the culture, um, you know, of the project. And, um, but some of the people who came out of the woodwork and who were just did amazing work early in the project are folks like, uh, like Micah Cornfield from, from Google, who was, you know, responsible for getting, you know, Arrow into Google's infrastructure, getting Arrow support into BigQuery, um, things like that and helping build out like the parquet support that, you know, now like huge fraction of the data science ecosystem depends on, um, you know, Uwe Korn from, from blue lot, blue yonder, uh, in Germany, you know, without him to take care of all the Conda forge and packaging and, and doing also tons of tons of development to make, make arrow work well for Python, you know, would, would have made the, the project that we have today, you know, substantially different, um, I think one of the things that I've really been impressed with is the cross like uh, language diversity and, and the kinds of productive collaborations we've had across language boundaries. And so in 2018, you saw those, the cascade of code donations. And so one of the most interesting areas the community grew was connecting with the Japanese um, Ruby community. So uh, Kohei Suto, who has a re pre-recorded talk uh, with subtitles uh, here, um, you know, stepped up and, uh, you know, really grew the project in pretty significant ways, opening up, uh, opening up, uh, arrow to, um, you know, to see users to, uh, to Ruby, um, as well as taking on like a great deal of work to, to, uh, expand and, and develop the, the CI CD infrastructure that the project depends on to be able to uh, accommodate as many contributors as we have, um, so my, you know, my own team in, you know, 2018 with the support of, you know, with the support of our studio and two Sigma and others, 
Um, you know, I was able to build a, a team of a half dozen people that included, you know, folks like Neil Richardson, who, you know, drove the development of the R package and, and ecosystem uh, for Arrow, you know, Antoine Petru, who's a Python C core developer, uh, who's, you know, about to dethrone me as the, with the number one number of contributions, you know, to, to the project. Um, I think the, you know, I've been very focused on the, the C++ ecosystem, but one really amazing thing has been the, the fast growing Rust ecosystem. And so folks like, uh, you know, so folks like Andy Grove and Andy and Andrew Lamb, um, and, uh, and Georgie, uh, you know, Carly Leta, uh, uh, I'll mispronouncing his name, but Georgie, uh, have, uh, you know, have done an amazing, you know, job, um, expanding the scope of rust work in the project and recruiting, uh, recruiting developers, uh, to do, to do development, you know, in rust. And so, you know, to me, the whole, the rust side of arrow is this whole, you know, mind of its own. Um, another area that I think has been critical is, is increasing the accessibility, um, of, of arrow to users and not just, not just developers. And so, you know, we've had some more recent initiatives like the arrow cookbook, which is really focused on users and usability and UX. And so, you know, Alessandro and, and Nick have, have driven, have driven this effort. And so it's, it definitely, you know, reflects the, the stage that we're at that, that not only do we need to scale our ability to have more developers working on the project, but we also have to increase the project's accessibility and, and usability for, um, you know, for users. Um, but obviously, you know, with nearly a thousand people having contributed to the project, it's hard to acknowledge everyone, but, you know, it's easy to like point back at the country, you know, creators of an open source project and say, you know, well, you know, these three or four people did it, but the reality is that it took a, it, it took a, it took a village to, to build this project and, you know, to really deliberately, you know, be mindfully seeking out people with different experiences and different perspectives and, and, uh, and capabilities and expertise um, to shoulder, you know, to do the, the best work possible to make uh, all the different dimensions of the project uh, um, and uh, move, you know, like a well-oiled machine. Yeah, no, I, I, I second that. I mean, I think that, you know, the people on this slide, but, you know, uh, you know many, many other people as well. Um, are what make it a great project. Um, you know, Wes and I were lucky enough to be at the right place and have a position to 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 start some stuff. Um, um, but the you know uh, Apache has this concept of community over code. Um, I think it's something we've embraced very well, um, and it's really about saying like, hey, if we can get great people involved. Um, then that's the best thing that could possibly happen for the community. Um, and so, you know, I had a manager once who said to me, like, the best thing you can do whenever you're trying to hire someone is look for someone who can potentially someday become your replacement or maybe tomorrow become your replacement. Um, and so, or, you know, and so I think that in, in, in some ways, when we think about getting these people involved, it's like, wow, these people, they can do all the stuff that I can do and then a bunch of stuff way better than I can do. Um, that, that's a really great addition to the community. And so, yes, you know, it's really a thank you to everybody um, that has been able to create it. Cause you know, I think, you know, Wes and I had grand visions of what this could possibly be six years ago, seven years ago. I remember us talking to, to um, uh, analysts and whatnot. You can go probably find some of those old articles where we're talking about like, Hey man, 80% of all data is going to move through arrow in five years. Uh, and maybe it's not 80%, but it's a hell of a lot more than I would have ever hoped. Yeah. And so I think, you know, along with increasing, you know, we have got, you know, a dozen or so programming languages represented in the project. And so, you know, we, uh, I think we've had to, um, you know, um, make sure that we're, you know, we're listening and we're, we're uh, hearing that, you know, the perspectives that other, other people bring, to bring to the table, um, you know, because different communities work in work in different ways. And, you know, I think we've, we've learned a lot from, you know, the Rust and Julia communities, you know, more modern, uh, you know, technology stacks. And I think that 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 diversity has been uh, has been our has been our strength, even though it has presented some unique you know unique challenges to to scaling uh, to scaling the project. Um, so before we run out of time, so one you know one one uh, dimension that I think is really an important aspect of where the future of Arrow is going is um, these all these Arrow software components that we're building, providing a foundation for the next generation of query processing systems. So. Um, you know, we have multiple query engine projects happening inside Arrow, you know, outside, you know, outside Arrow, um, you know, uh, Meta has, is developing a, a columnar a query, ex a database acceleration library called Velox, you know, to accelerate Presto um, and, uh, and other things. And, 
Um, you know, that, that is, you know, you, that is using arrow. We've got the data fusion project in, in rust and there's been, you know, people building databases and data warehouses that are in rust. They're using data fusion, uh, influx, uh, influx data is building their next generation time series engine, uh, on top of data fusion influx it's called influx DB IOX. Uh, so I'm very excited about this. And I think, you know, now that the, you know, arrow has been accepted as this de facto standard for, um, in memory representation and interoperability that, that I think more, it makes sense that more and more of the compu uh, community's focus would, would, would skew towards these computation primitives and consolidating effort on building these really high quality uh, data processing engines that can become, you know, ubiquitous, um, you know, kind of the ubiquitous uh, foundation for, um, you know, the next one or two decades of, of analytical computing systems. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, uh, you know, if you have to sit down and you have to start by writing, uh, you know, some, 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 some drivers to work with your hardware and you have to write, you know, a linked list implementation because you need a linked list and you have to build everything from scratch, um, it drastically reduces the level of creativity that you can have. I think that as what we start to see is, is that as you have all of these sort of pre-built components, high quality components that allow you to kind of stitch these things together, um, there's a whole um, broader group of people who can be much more creative about what they're creating. And we're seeing lots of, I think, really interesting things, not only in terms of how people are sort of putting these things together and supporting, you know, new ways to build processing systems and, 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 and faster ways and, and, and ways that have, you know, higher efficiency or take advantage of specific compute. Um, you see all of those things happening um, and they're happening in a much, much wider community than they were. Like if you think about, you know, 20 years ago, um, how many people were building, you know, data technologies, building database kernel like things. It was a very small group of people who were coming out of a couple of um, PhD programs. Um, and now, you know, uh, you know, for the, for the, you know, the every, every developer who's contributed to Arrow, um, you know, there's 10 or a hundred out there that are taking these components and building stuff with them. Um, and so that community has gotten much, much larger. Um, I think that's really, really powerful. And so, you know, I think Wes is, you know, going to the sort of last slide here, uh, thinking about sort of where this world goes long-term and sort of what's going to seem obvious in hindsight. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned early on in the talk, one of the things that I've been very excited about is, is that, um, you know, if you think about what happened with Arrow, we started out with a structure of data, um, and then we were able to build all of these common components that people could share on top of that and built a vibrant community. Um, I actually think that one of the obvious places where that will continue to occur is at the compute layer. Um, when we start thinking about actually how you express compute and start sharing that, that's why I'm excited about the substrate stuff. I think the other thing that I'm very excited about is, is that um, you know historically, databases have been thought of as generally fairly, fairly monolithic. Um, and in order to get into a market and sort of compete, you have to build um, all the functionality that someone needs from an analytic system. Um, and I think that what we'll see over time is, is that um, uh, people are going to start to be able to pick and choose and build best of breed kinds of analytics approaches um, because they're going to be able to say, oh, this specialized system is good for this um, subset of workloads. And I think that the um, elasticity, elasticity of cloud compute and the abstraction um, of processing from having to actually own the software and manage the machines um, gives us this capability to be much more dynamic about how things are working together. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, I think um, you know we're we're uh, we're about to wrap up here since uh, we've got uh, we've got some panels and other other great stuff to to move on to. Um, but I think the things that I'm really excited about for the you know the next the next seven years are this this general trend of modularity and composability of of uh, of data engines and uh, and the you know, different components that that compose with the with the Arrow ecosystem, um, as well as increased focus on usability and language integration. So I think part one of the, the reasons, you know, that we started Arrow in the first place was so that we could have this really seamless language support and to have these data analytic capabilities more um, kind of, you know, woven within the way that people work in, the, in, their preferred, in their preferred programming languages. And so I think the work that Jacques, you know, described with Substrate enables us to, you know, uh, more you know, easily achieve that modularity and composability so that we can focus on basically the top layer of the stack, the data frame APIs, the SQL interfaces, and how we can make, you know, make these systems not only super efficient, hardware accelerated, you know, fast and you know, resource efficient, use less carbon, all those good things, but that we can also create systems that are really pleasant to use. And you can you know, sort of use your preferred programming language and you have, you know, a way of working with large quantities of data that's natural uh, and uh, and productive for uh, for the users. So I uh, 
really appreciate everyone tuning in for this for this live session. I hope this was an interesting, you know, interesting conversation. Uh, obviously, you know, we're very passionate about um, very passionate about this problem. We've been working in this in this space for a long time, but in many ways, it feels like we're just beginning. And so, um, you know, I, I while we've achieved a lot, uh, we certainly can't rest on our laurels. And uh, I think the community has has great things, uh, you know, great things to do. Uh, to do yet. And so I'm really looking forward to what comes, what comes next. And I, I look forward to, you know, everyone, you know, everyone here listening, I look forward to working with you and, uh, and, uh, you know, ha- and collaborating in the, in the ecosystem. Me as well. Thanks so much for having me, Wes. Thank you so much, Wes and Jacques. That was an excellent talk. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. I thought it was, it was really great. And um, just very excited about the future of Arrow. Um, I will say as well, if you are enjoying a talk that you've watched and would like to share about that, please use social media and tweet hashtag uh, the data thread. You can tweet, you can share on LinkedIn, you can share on Instagram, wherever you feel is good. Uh, but definitely um let us know what your thoughts are about the talks that have been happening. The next session we are going to have is going to be led by Zheng Brewer, who is the Vice President of Product Strategy at Voltron Data. Um, so I'm just gonna uh, leave it to Zheng to introduce the uh, High Performance Computing Panel. Thank you, Marlene. Um, can you guys hear me and see me okay? Wonderful, I see some thumbs up. Um, so welcome um, to the High Performance Computing Panel. Um, I am so honored to be joined by three distinguished panelists who are not only responsible for contributing to the development of HPC, but also their experience in applying it. So um, one of the things that I'm super excited personally, and you know, when I was asked to, to moderate this panel, I was just like, hey, this is a great opportunity to learn more about HPC. And as you kind of heard from Wes and Jock, how some of the way that we apply um, is one of the key things that we wanted to get out of this discussion. So yeah. some of the key areas are, what are some of the innovation benefits in terms of HPC? how everyone could leverage it, and also just to learn more about it. So with that, um, I would love to get the panel started. And um, I-, I was thinking maybe a fun way of getting to know everybody. Thank you, panelists, for coming onto the video. Uh, maybe a best way to do it is just to ask each one of you to do a really <laughs> fast introduction of yourself. So what are you, what are you, who are you? And also maybe a really fun thing that you're currently working on. So let's start with Jim. Okay, hello. Uh, yes, I'm Jim Pavarsky, a research scientist at Princeton University. Um, and uh, well, the fun thing that I'm working on is, uh, oh, sorry, the lighting went out. The fun thing that I'm working on is uh, Awkward Array, uh, the uh, um, a, uh, a uh, NumPy-like interface to uh, arrow-like data. And your background is just so adorable. <laughs> Thanks. Carlos, it, let's go to your next. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm Carlos Malzahn. I'm a faculty at UC Santa Cruz. Um, my specialty is storage systems. And my fun project of uh, the year, on the two, last two years, is to actually embed Apache Arrow into Ceph. Um, I'm, I'm one of the founders of the Ceph project, and uh, I, I love how we can connect the two projects, Ceph and Apache Arrow, in, in creative ways. Thank you, Carlos. And Fernanda? Hi, folks. I'm Fernanda Forder. Um, my background is in high-performance computing. I spent about six years working in the life sciences, genomics, uh, helping folks uh, connect their data there and then about uh, seven years working in the hardware side, uh, building supercomputers at Oak Ridge National Lab, um, and also working for a couple of chip companies. Um, currently, I'm at Voltron Data, working on um, all aspects of the Apache Arrow ecosystem. I am Director of Developer Relations here. Thank you, panelists. Okay, so I'm gonna first start with just some basics. 
Um, I think one of the simplest definitions that I heard is that HPC is the ability to process data and platform uh, and perform complex calculations at high speed. So what does that what does that exactly mean? I mean, it sounds like very simple, intuitive, but what does it mean? And why is HPC important, especially now? And, you know, I'd love to kind of hear a little bit about um, what it is. So, Fernanda, let's start with you, since um, your background for the last you know years you have been working on this. So love to hear your perspective. Yeah, so HPC is something that has you know been around for a long time for people that needed to use high performance computing or just <laughs> needed to use computing just to do simulation. Um, then it got a bit more formalized in the mid two thousands as uh, chips became more easily available and commodity uh, hardware became more easily available instead of creating custom work. Um, about two thousand eight, we have a change in the chip technology. We went from single core to multi core. And in about 2012, we have this boom of accelerators that we see today, which is a made way for artificial intelligence. So at its core, it's a, a really big machine. We're talking something like thousands of cores. When I started in at Oak Ridge National Lab, we had a computer that had 18,688 nodes, about 300,000 cores. And now I can't even, I think I downloaded some stats. Uh, Frontier has like 9,000 nodes, but each of the uh, GPUs in there have uh, 37,000 cores inside them. Um, and so that leads us into thinking, well, okay, well, uh, computing is easy compared to actually moving data. Feeding these systems becomes the difficulty here. And these systems have very um, high speed interconnected networks, um, but how do we leverage feeding data uh, just so that we can do the compute is the next um, hard part because we can build accelerators um, that can eat up data in a matter of, you know, sub milli, super milliseconds. Um, and that's where we are now is how do we then op optimize not just the compute part, but now we optimize um, data, data movement, um, and actually placing data and compute closer to one another so that we can get the most um, for our buck here. So the system is hungry and it wants Very. to consume a lot of data. And I think, Carlos, this is where I would love to hear your perspective, especially with your experience in the storage. What are some of the changes that are made in the storage so that it can you know, feed the hunger? Yeah, it's actually, uh, it can... Uh, obviously, you need uh, very parallel storage so that, um, you know, even with uh, faster devices, you can have a lot of devices working in parallel to provide the data. But the other, uh, the, the other side of the coin is actually one of the key challenges in HPC is actually also the production of data. Um, so the applications in HPC, as, uh, uh, as already mentioned, was basically the there are simulations and the simulations are very tightly coupled. And so when something goes wrong, like a node uh, fails or some device fails, you cannot actually really just work around that. Uh, you have to kind of restart the simulation. And in order to restart the simulation, you don't want to start from the beginning because then you will never finish the simulation. And so you do checkpoints. Um, and these checkpoints basically dump a whole lot of data from those different compute nodes into the storage system. And, uh, and there are, you know, millions of processes uh, dumping data into the storage system. And how do you do that? How do you make sure that you minimize the resource sharing in the storage system so everybody can just dump data as fast as possible without being impeded by locking or any kind of coordination? Um, and so the problem occurs when you want to Okay, so there's a very simple solution. You just dump, each process dumps into a single file. And so everything's independent, it's great, right? So you now have million processes dumping into a million files. And now you want to load the data, but you only have, let's say 300,000 processes. So how do you actually decide which of the processes is loading which of the files, right? It's not a one-to-one -one relationship anymore and it becomes really complex. Um, so this is uh, what um, I think uh, there's a, you know, there are lots of called middleware systems that make a lot of uh, coordination. There's a lot of data being transferred between processes to make sure that the data gets stored in a way that can easily, is easily accessible. And that's where I think Apache Arrow comes in 
and the formats that uh, you know that attach to the project in terms of storage formats, how do you actually store the data as fast as HPC wants it, but do it in a format that's actually columnar? And you have to remember, you know, the simulations are all in time steps typically, right? And so they're actually fu fundamentally row-based. But then you, you want to actually, for the analysis, you want to have columnar data. So how do you convert all this data on the fly into a format that is actually easily accessible for analysis software after the simulation has completed or even during the simulations? Uh, and that's a huge challenge um, and there has been solutions within the HPC space. Uh, there's some system uh, that's quite successful called Adios that's actually uh, created by uh, Oak Ridge. Um, uh, but there are other uh, systems that, um, that are kind of competing with it, and, but they don't use Apache Arrow. And I think there is sort of a, a really great uh, opportunity to really to create something new that connects that whole ecosystem of HPC with the data science uh, ecosystem through that through the file format. So that's that's really interesting. So the HPC has the ability to consume a lot of data, but if you don't bring the data, then it's not going to be as useful. So I wanted to turn the conversation a little bit to Jim. Um, Jim, you were at uh, LHC and Open Data Group, and I'm sure you had to deal with a lot of a lot of data. So I would love to kind of hear a little bit about how you um, and your organization leverage HPC and um, you know, what are some of the challenges and what are some of the, the benefits that you're able to get out of it? Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, I've been a lot more involved in the users of HPC, the, uh, the data analysts who are developing the, uh, the analyses that are going to run on these machines. Uh, um, Years ago, as one myself, and now I'm more of a tool developer, but I'm working directly with them. And there, there's a third problem that hasn't been mentioned yet, which is uh, uh, getting people whose expertise is in the sciences uh, to, um, to be able to interact with these computing systems. Um, uh, and so traditionally, in, in high energy physics, I should say, uh, traditionally, uh, the data analysts were writing C++ programs. Many of them without, um, you know, without explicit training. So these uh, uh, these jobs would go out on the, the worldwide grid on the you know finding an HPC center somewhere, and uh, many of them would would fail immediately. And that, you know, that's a cost as well, not not just a human cost, also the uh, um, computation time. So. Um, uh, in the past five years or so, uh, we've been able to move. Uh, more from data analysts working directly in C++ to some mixture of C++ and Python. Uh, and that mixture has been largely, it has been enabled by uh, uh, data science tools being, uh, a lot of them being Python first, giving a, a, a nice interface that uh, um, scientists can, can understand directly, you know, with, without uh, uh, deep knowledge of uh, uh, hardware internals. Um, but also uh, being able to do Python fast in order to be able to, to uh, apply these procedures to large data sets. And to, to throw in another monkey wrench, um, the, the reason, oh, well, I should say, I like the, the, the slide from the first talk about uh, deconstructing a database. Um, uh, for our community, we are more than a database. We come from a point where everything are these separate one-off uh, things accessing uh, direct files. And we're trying to get more into a more managed situation uh, and, and reap those benefits. Um, and the thing that has been um, uh, preventing that, the thing that's been getting in the way, is that we fundamentally need uh, more complex data and more complex processing than you can express in, say, SQL with flat tables. So uh, the, the thing that I want to call out about Arrow is that it's not just columnar, it's columnar for uh, nested data structures of variable length, the kinds of things that would have forced us in the past to go to, uh, uh, say, C++ classes containing standard vectors, uh, standard strings, all these variable length things that are very um, heap heavy, you know, getting, you know, a lot of pointer chasing, a lot of uh, um, uh, reasons why that slows down, to something that is, uh, has sequential memory access, uh, and not just for the, the very uh, professional C++ programmers, but also for 
uh, Python users uh, using it and you know doing slices and you know combinatorics through uh, through predefined kernels and such. So, so so far, what I'm what I'm like the the brands that I'm hearing right that's using HPC is the um, much larger national. Um, laboratories, research, research centers that have a lot of facilities. And there's a lot of chat going on as well that talks about how many cores and, and just lots and lots of it. But is HBC only available um, for larger organizations? Um, I think, Carlos, you mentioned the leadership class, um, you know, organizations. Or can any size, like the mid-size organizations, also enjoy the power of HPC? Carlos, I would love to hear your perspective on that. Oh, I think he's frozen. Thank you. Um, so I think there's a lot of there's. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of uh, uh, groups, a lot of research groups throughout the country and throughout the world that are smaller research groups, right? They have mid-size HPC systems, uh, and those are actually public, right? So UC Santa Cruz have, for instance, a a, a system that uh, the astronomy astronomy folks use, the astrophysics physicists use uh, for um, doing simulations of the cosmos, um, doing all kinds of, uh, you know, black hole simulations, uh, you know, things that, that astronomers um, care about. And uh, these are not these huge systems, right? They have their own installations. They are typically a normal, you know, raised floor machine room. Um, things that uh, every organization uh, can afford. And there's a whole industry that supplies this. Um, you know, major corporations that um, I don't want to really name here, but they basically, they have a really good um, customer care and support. And, you know, there's a bidding process, obviously, for these organizations, right? All these things are, is, 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 is public information, especially when you look at the universities, uh, like for instance, UC Santa Cruz. Um, and uh, there, you know, uh, that's, I think, is a very good starting point for mid-sized organizations to, to install an HPC system. And Fernanda, any thoughts uh, in terms of, you know, how um, the open source that plays into this space? I know we mentioned <laughs> Arrow. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, HPC has always been about open source. Um, we had to because there was no other uh, vendor out there making the operating system and creating these um, libraries. In fact, a lot of governments put in a lot of money to make mathematical libraries available to um, everyone. Um, and then we've got, you know, some vendors that have actually optimized the libraries and have taken um, upon them to get closer to the, their hardware. So NVIDIA has a lot of libraries that they make that are freely available, but they're not open source. Um, but we have to continue the open source, um, you know, march because to be able to innovate, it requires all of us to be involved. We cannot depend on a single vendor. Uh, or even, you know, multiple vendors really to do that kind of work. Um, they're not going to be agile enough for the needs of the world, and especially the needs of HPC as everything's growing. Um, but, you know, back to your question on like organizational size, um, I work with folks that were doing um, truck discovery all through COVID and we ran out of capacity. They ran out of capacity within their own organizations and their sort of medium size HPC, small to medium size. And then we had to burst to the cloud. And a lot of my work at that time was connecting these uh, pharma companies to cloud instances of HPC um, to get them to be able to do their work. Um, so I'm not sure that we have small um, HPC anymore. Everyone has to do some HPC. Everyone is going to grow with their HPC because uh, lucky for us and lucky for folks like Voltron, uh, data is, is easy to acquire and easy to generate. It's the analysis that trips people up. Um, and until we get to the point where analysis becomes easier, um, they're just going to pile up data until that day, uh, kind of waiting for that day to come. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. Um, I Just like how we started, I would like to conclude this discussion by asking each panelist to talk about, you know, what are some of your wish lists for HPC in the future? 
And, you know, what are some of your call to actions for people that are going to be um, that are listening today and going to be listened on the, the video? Um, let's start with you, Jim. OK, well, I interpreted that question from um, the perspective of tool developers. Um, and one thing that I've noticed uh, uh, is that the newer developers uh, coming into this uh, um, into this academic field uh, have uh, been a lot more willing to contribute a little bit to a lot of projects. So um, whereas in the past people would 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 like own a project and this would be the the, the thing that they're attached to uh, for a long long time, um, and that's how they would you know they would associate their name with it. Uh, people have been very willing to. Uh, to sort of smooth out the kinks between things in the ecosystem by uh, by you know contributing to everything, I think this is a good trend, and I'd like to see it continue, uh, or I'd like to see it to, to see it grow. Uh, I feel like this is something that we're learning from the data science community. Um, uh, but the uh, and what I would want to have, what I want to have happen is that that it's not uh, opposed. You know that uh, that uh, people can get recognition for. Um, uh, for this kind of interconnecting work, uh, as much as uh, uh, like, you know, owning such and such a project, being the person who made such and such a project. Wonderful. So contribute and collaborate. <clears throat> Carlos. Yeah, I I like to second said Jim. I think that's a that's really important, right? There's so many really great examples where uh, people from nowhere figured out how to connect two things and really created sort of this watershed moment where suddenly things flowed where they didn't flow before. Um, the other thing that I like to highlight is, you know, as, as we build up this um, tool chain and West, I think, you know, also pointed out earlier in this talk that, you know, we really want to uh, make that easier to use for everyone. And ease of use is actually not just a convenience. It's, I think, essential for, for reducing time to insight mm -hmm. and also reducing the frustration that every newcomer has to go through, it seems, uh, to, to, to be productive and to really create a tool chain and create um, experiments, create uh, you know, tutorials, create things for the classroom that are fun to use and that have, you know, get uh, students and, and you know, anyone who's interested uh, much faster to to the point where they actually learn something. Um, you know, all of us have probably learned the steep learning curves some of these systems provide, and it's just uh, you know a lot of people are falling off the you know, on the way inside, and and I think we can't really afford that anymore. So make it easy so that people can use it. And Fernanda, take us home. Um. I think there's still so much performance that we can extract from compute systems that sit actually right next to data. Um, my call to action is let's, let's agree to stop moving data, slosh data out across the world. Let's find ways that we can be more efficient with um, our compute resources. Um, and I would still love, I, I would love for people to think about um, just thinking of data as a as an exchange between compute resources as as less as the least you need it to exchange it as opposed to having vast you know monolithic data sets that kind of move to a new system and then just so you can take advantage of the compute cycles that are available there let's think about what is the work that we need to be able to do and how much little data we can move as opposed to having copies of data that take up a lot of space, that take up a lot of energy, and be more um, cognizant of the energy footprint that these systems do take um, so that we can take advantage of actually the insights that data give us without having uh, so much impact on the world that we're living in currently. So work sm smarter and not harder. And work data smarter, not harder. harder. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. Um, I I see there's a lot of chat uh, going on, and I know that we have a dedicated Q and A session. So um, please hold off your question until Q and A session. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much, Jim, Carlos, and Fernanda, for this really engaging discussions. We only scratched the surface of it. 
but I think there's a lot of really interesting stuff that um, you can find uh, and kind of keep repeating what Marlene was saying. There's a lot of talks also on our web. Uh, we're going to be posting it so that you can find uh, lots of different interesting conversations and also how to apply uh, HBC. With that, I'm going to close the panel and I'm going to pass it back to you, Marlena. Or Marlene, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jing. Um, that was a fantastic panel on HPC, uh, such an interesting field. And as Lai Ching said, there were so many questions and comments in the chat. And feel free if you haven't already, if you do already have a comment that you would like the speakers to answer later on in our session, um, please go ahead and put it in the chat. Or if you'd like to send it uh, privately, please feel free to send it to the panelist list, I think. Um, and that should be answered as well. Um, so next, we are going to have a uh, fireside chat. Um, and this is a fireside chat that is going to be between Peter Wang and Joshua Patterson. Um, uh, Josh is the CEO of Voltron Data, and Peter is the CEO of Anaconda Inc. Um, let me just read out uh, Peter's bio. Peter Wang has been developing commercial scientific computing and visualization software for over 15 years. He has extensive experience in uh, software design and development across a broad range of areas, including 3D graphics, geophysics, large data simulation, financial risk modeling, and medical imaging. Um, if you are interested in how uh, Python and Arrow are, are being used together in this space, feel free to continue watching. And uh, yeah, I'm gonna hand it over to Josh and Peter Wang. Peter, thank you again for uh, joining us at the Data Thread. Uh, before we jump in, do you want to give a quick background of uh, how you got involved with the Python ecosystem and really just data science in general? Yeah, sure thing. And uh, thank you for having me. I'm really, really excited to chat with you today. Um, so the way I got started, I guess, um, is that I, well, I, I fell in love with Python when I was a C++ programmer, um, but this was like 20 years ago. Um, and I just liked it for its, for the language. I wasn't using it for numerics or anything like that. I liked the level of general sort of generic programming I could do and the high level thoughts I could have. And, you know, people sometimes have that experience of Python being executable pseudocode, right? And I certainly love that. It was so much more painless compared to um, fighting with C++ templates, again, in their state 20 years ago. Um, but then I, I got a job as a consultant doing scientific computing with Python, and that drew upon some of my, my mathematical background as a physicist. Um, and I enjoyed doing that for a number of years. But then as I saw Python and numerical Python getting used in more business applications, in more numerical and financial analysis, um, you know, more database connectors coming out as Python was turning into more of a web programming language, all those things led into, um, I think, a very seminal uh, few years, right at the turn of the 2010s. And um, that was when um, the, the Pandas project was also just kind of getting released. And uh, so a lot of things were coming together. Jupyter Notebook came out around the same time. All these things came together to, I think, make it possible to really take Python, the language, and it's like little niche scientific numerical tools and put them on the center stage for doing very, very um, agile data analysis, data exploration in a very high performance manner for business data purposes. So um, my co-founder, Travis Oliphant and I, we started the company um, Anaconda. Well, we started as Continuum Analytics, but we started in 2012 because we saw all these threads coming together and said, you know what? People really need to have agility. They really appreciate having high performance and they're asking deeper, more mathematical questions than simply counting things, right? So we wanna put all these together, all these capabilities together and give them this open source foundation for all this stuff. And that's how I got started with all this stuff. And now it's been an incredible 10 years because um, it's gone by really fast and really slow at the same time. I, I can only imagine. You said three things that I would love to talk more about. Uh, ease of sure. use, mm -hmm. um, open source and foundations. Um, and there was one thing that you did talk about that you talk about a lot uh, in some of your other talks around performance. Um, and, and I would love to kind of just, you know, uh, really drill into those three things uh, sure. and understand, you know, where you think these things are going. So let's just start with 
how I think most things started with uh, with Python and, and its uh, evolution into the data analytics ecosystem with ease of use. Mm -hmm. So ease of use is, um, I think when something is, um, you know, if something is difficult and then you make it a little bit easier to use, then the people who are using it, they might like you because you made their lives a little bit easier, okay? But if you make something tremendously easier to use, then you actually end up with this weird dynamic. You open up um, the ability for a lot more people to do the thing that used to be very hard. And this pervert, it creates this really odd sort of thing where the people who didn't, couldn't do this before now are like, oh, this is an interesting thing I can do. So now it's, it turns from ease of use to accessibility. Now a lot more democratization, a lot more people can do this thing that used to be the domain of experts. And then the people for whom their identity was, I solved this hard problem. They actually end up hating you because you didn't make their lives easier. You made their jobs redundant, right? Which is a really, or rather you made it so that 50% of them, uh, their jobs are done, and the other fifty percent become even more specialized in the niche. So it's a specialization generalization kind of kind of issue. And this may seem a bit high level and hand wavy, but this is exactly what has happened um, in the space. What we found was that um, you know even fifteen years ago, when people were starting to use Python for scientific programming, and this is to do scientific simulation, to write numerical code that they would have other use, otherwise used MATLAB or C or Fortran to do, they started doing it in Python. And initially, the, the feeling you would get is like, oh, isn't it interesting? I could do this in Python and the code is readable. I can do it in an afternoon. Gosh, I wish it wasn't so slow. We're like, well, we can make the slow bits fast. What we can't do is make everyone who knows engineering into a C++ nerd. Like that's much harder, right? So this is the ease of use thing. I want to make sure we're very clear. At some level, you know, a certain change in degree becomes a change in kind. When you make things so much dramatically easier to use, then you actually change the demography around who is using it, who gets to do it. And that has then social implications, job implications, all these kinds of things. So it becomes kind of political once you make something really easy to use. It's odd, but it's something that's now very obvious to me in retrospect. And, and we see this today. The, the growth of the uh, data analytics community, the data science community has exploded. And we commonly see Python um, as the uh, the tool of choice for many uh, practitioners when they're first joining uh, the ecosystem. And now with performance, it's becoming the tool of choice of everyone, essentially. Um, right. How did we strike this balance? Or, you know, what were the things that we did that allowed Python to strike this balance between ease of use and uh, performance? Um, well, it's, it's uh, th the center of the language has kind of struck a balance. But, you know, it's not, um, it's not either or, right? Python at the extreme has gotten much higher performance. Um, so it's not like we compromised on performance. We just made it so this sort of the median, sort of, uh, someone of median skill can go and get higher performance. But someone of extreme skill can, even, can get even more performance, right? Um, so I think the way that has happened, ultimately, it comes down to a really simple thing, which is that... When you have a modular, well-designed um, set of standards around kind of this ecosystem, it allows it, well, it allows the ecosystem to flourish as opposed to being single sort of uh, lane innovation. Like one person is gatekeeping or one entity is gatekeeping what it gets to do. Um, and I think we see this where, you know, when we started Anaconda or Continuum, um, we we're trying to put Python on the map for data analytics. And at the time, the big thing in the room was Hadoop. It was sort of like the Hadoopening, you know, it's like it was just all over. This elephant was going to stomp over the entire jungle because all anyone could talk about was Hadoop and big data, big data synonymous with Hadoop. And that was 2010s, you know, 2012, that time frame. Um, and very quickly, that ecosystem got closed over, I would say, by a bunch of commercial vendors. So you had a flood of interest from people who are like, oh, my God, I can't put all my data in my classical data warehouse because it's too freaking expensive. Um <coughs> Excuse me. And so how do I um, deal with this? Oh, there's this great open source project. I could take it, bring it in-house, try it before I buy it, use it, implement it. This seems to work. It seems to scale. It's cheap. And then the instant they try to go like one step further, they would be met with a vendor selling something or the other. And so, in, so the Hadoop landscape 
you know, there are two big players, right, that sort of emerged between Hortonworks and Cloudera. And there was a host of other people who built connectors into the Hadoop ecosystem. But there was really just one vendor uh, or two vendors, but it was just like a very clear commercialization path there. And if you wanted to op- if you wanted to innovate in that ecosystem, it also got very political because all these vendors now are taking a hard dependence on this open source technology. Okay, so compare and contrast then with the Python ecosystem, which at the time was a mouse. It was like, we're just, we're relevant too. You know, I know you guys love to do, but we're trying to be relevant. Python's great. I guess we're a snake and not a mouse if it's Python. But anyway, the point is the Python ecosystem continued to build in this open source incremental one standard after another people, you know, community innovation, I think is really the key word community, a community of innovators. And there's, you know, there's disagreements, there's fights, there's forks, there's egos. I mean, we're all people, but it kind of happens in the open and no one gets to tell anyone else they can't do this, right? People right. get to go and try, try to do it. And if it works, then it's like water. It just kind of flows. Water seeks its level. So it sort of flows. And so now you have this really cool parallel innovation, almost like a slime. I mean, it's literally a human ecology resembling a slime mold as it expands into a place and it finds where the sugar and the nutrients are. The open source ecosystem does this because there's not a single brain telling the slime mold, you must go in this direction or just that direction or ask permission before you branch here. So this is a long-winded answer, but I think it really comes down to a very fundamental thing, which is that these open standards and these open community processes facilitate an extremely broad uh, parallel search of the space. And there's a famous quote from, I think, Bill Joy, who said that, it doesn't matter how big of a company you are, all the smart people are outside the four walls of your office. And this is you know, more and more true in an interconnected world. Everyone can learn. You have high schoolers who have committed into uh, SciPy or committed, you know, commits into these core, le- core projects because it turns out there's talent everywhere. There's really smart people of all ages everywhere. So yes, it, it, no matter how big of an office or walls you have, everyone, all the smart people are outside the four walls. So if you can unlock a human collaboration mechanism that brings all that innovation in, now you're doing something magical and you can go faster and broader than just a single, like everything happens inside the four walls of this office kind of thing. I, I love it. Uh, the Apache Arrow project, that's kind of the, the cornerstone of, uh, of Voltron data and uh, really a kind of a larger open source uh, ecosystem. Um, if you look at the current Voltron data employees, we've uh, essentially, uh, you know, committed two thirds of the code every release, and uh, and about two thirds of the um, the reviews. But the number of commits and the number of uh, of PRs that get uh, merged in into the Apache Arrow uh, repo have grown exponentially. Mm. And I, and I think you're absolutely right with this kind of concept that uh, there's always smarter people outside of the company. And so no matter how much uh, we pour back into the uh, Apache Arrow ecosystem the community is always doing more. Um, Mm -hmm. And and it's one of the things that, you know, we really love about the project is the more that we put in, the more the community puts in as well. Um, And and I love this kind of, uh, this this breadth that you talk about in this parallel search um, that's enabled by uh, modularity and standards. Um, Can you talk more about that? What, 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 What value does that unlock for the, the, the commercial side, the business users, as well as uh, people who want to, um, you know, contribute to open source and continue to push innovation. Yeah, I think the, um, see, I'm trying to figure out how to say this in a concise way. The way I think about it is that, um, you know, there's that statement, I think it's, I don't know, is it, is it Larry Lessing that said like uh, code is law, right? And this idea that, uh, which of course is not not true, but not untrue either, right? right? That in the computational space, anytime someone uses a piece of software and especially any of their data or if they build other things on top of that software connecting to it, they are committing their own energy and resources into a thing. Um, and then if the person who owns that software, who runs the software that manages the data, if they decide to change it, you have no recourse but to follow them. And when I first got into sort of, um, well, not always, but there's a challenge, there's a danger that you might have to follow them when you're not ready. And so in a sense, these kinds of uh, a software interaction is no different than a human conversation, right? You're building a relationship there. Um, in this case, the relationship of either code with code or data inside some other code. Um, and so it's really important 
that we think about this the, the, the power dynamic in that relationship and in that conversation. And when I first started getting into selling enterprise software, I was, as we you know brought on some executives and whatnot, I was shocked to hear some of them talking about the fact that, yeah, in enterprise sales, you know, it's like, it's a well-known thing where the power of deprecation, the power to force your users to upgrade, right? The forced upgrade thing, which of course, IT departments everywhere in the world loathe, because if they have something working, why would they upgrade, right? And I think that dynamic is a really in, in, interesting thing to look at. It's, it's an imbalance of power. So when you have open source and you have these standards, what you're essentially saying is, look, at this point, we're putting it all on the table. And if we go from this point to the next point and you don't like where we're going, you don't have to come along. You always have a you know uh, an alternative that you can do. You have you have exit right. You have this option to just say I'm going to exit from this relationship. I'm going to take what I've done, my code I've written to talk to your code or my data I've put into your database. I'm going to take that whole thing. I'm going to do it over here. And so that right to fork is essentially what you've given uh, business users. That is very important for them, right? Because they they now know they have at least that bit of agency. And then the, the next level, second order thing in there is that if they have that agency, it means that if you do have a commercial relationship with them, you're going to, um, I wouldn't say you're going to be more honest, but it just changes the power, di- the power dynamic, right? And so it sort of forces you to be more um, receptive to their needs and whatnot, because they can always just leave versus in a, in a proprietary and in a non-standard kind of thing, you're stuck. You're like, do I use the old stuff that's busted and maybe has security vulnerabilities or do I take this forced upgrade? That's going to be like a two-year migration effort. And you're just like, you're hosed. And it's really, really bad. And that's why people defect to open source. And that's why open source is taking over the world, right? It's because it turns out the users of software, the, the, the people with the data that they put into these data systems, they want to have agency. They want to have power. <laughs> Not surprising. So I think that's why standards are so important. Now, the important thing that, that one of the challenges is if we try to create standards a priori and ahead of the use, ahead of the use, that's not so helpful, right? Because you always miss with those things. It's better to look at what worked and then codify what the sort of crowdsource consensus is around what's working, what the standard should be. Oh, Josh, sorry, you're muted. I was on mute, sorry. Uh, absolutely. I, I think one other option uh, is also um, is leaving and rewriting. And so it's, it's either you know upgrading, staying with deprecated software, but the cost of leaving sometimes is extremely high, especially when you're in uh, large organizations. Um, and, and I think, you know, as you said, open source gives this kind of third path as well, where mm-hmm. they can fork and, you know, uh, extend in their own way. Uh, and, and we've seen that, you know, fairly often in some large open source projects where a large enough group of people are like, you know, we, we like where we are here. We don't want to go where the future direction is going, but we want to go in this right. other direction. Um and, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, it sometimes splits projects, uh, but it really mm-hmm. gives people this freedom to innovate in a way that's, uh, you know, really kind of beneficial and a win-win uh, for them and, and the community uh, most of the time. Right. And so one of the things uh, I, I'm hearing kind of is balance. There's balance between, you know, modularity, composability and innovation, balance between ease of use and performance, um, you know, balance between uh you know, corporate needs and open source governance. Uh, where do you where do you see this balance going? What do you think will uh, kind of allow open source to continue this run as becoming this uh, the standard in the 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 data industry? So I think it's really important. Um, uh, at the end of the day, all these things are not technical problems; they're people problems, right? Right. Um, and so, you know, just as I talked about how open source and standards, it gives users a a bad, a best alternative to negotiate agreement, right? So if they have an alternative; they can do something else instead of buying whatever forced upgrade you're trying to shove down their throats. Um, there's a power restoration there, but I think in order for these 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 things to be held in balance, we have to. Um, maybe more explicitly render all the, the, the needs and the, um, uh, the, the capabilities of all the different parties, right? Uh, and I think this is where the open source conversation is starting to head, but it's not, you know, it's, 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 made, it's made some improvements there, but there's a long way to go still. And what I mean by this is that um, it, it's a collaboration. Uh, you know, we're producing these kinds of things that can have great, great leverage 
because these are tools for the information economy. These are tools for information systems. And that's very, very high margin, highly leveraged investment for companies. So if a company, whatever business you're in, if you buy a piece of capital equipment, you buy a piece of land, it's not nearly as leveraged as if you invest in the knowledge infrastructure for how you think about your users, your supply chain, your, your capabilities internally, all these things. So when we talk about open source software in particular, it, I wish that we can move the conversation around software into this collaboration space so that the customers, the users, the makers, the documenters, the debuggers, the community, uh, you know, DevRel folks, everybody understands we're working in kind of, we're working in, in unison on some things and we have disagreements and whatnot. But if everyone puts their needs on the table, that's much better than if there is sort of like, you know, some people who are only takers, right? Or people who are only givers. That's not a good dynamic either. And this is when we talk about open source, maintainer burnout and all these kinds of things. It's that dynamic. You know, you have companies that, uh, you have individuals who produce software that powers billions of dollars of GDP. And then you have companies that are making a lot of money from their use of that, that are not paying into the ecosystem when they totally could. They just, they're not forced to because their sense-making structure as an institution is we only do things we're forced to, right? And so um, I think for this to be sustainable in the long run, the some parts of the, you know, neocortex of those companies have to kind of come in, whether it's open source program offices or whether it's um, technology uh, evangelists, people, you know, like you and I who have some voice in the ecosystem as thought leaders, really driving point at the home, uh, driving uh, the point home that this is a commons and you have to pay into the commons. Otherwise the commons disappears. And so I think if we can do that, then in the long run, that balance can be maintained. The instant that people decide to turn it into a scarcity, you know, it's a race to the bottom, then we end up in a, in a worse place. And it's really like anything else. It's a human, it's it's prisoner's dilemma. It's a tragedy of the common situation. And the best way to, uh, I think one of the best ways to, to make that work in the long run is just to put, uh, put it all out on the open of how much people are using, what people are getting out of it, and what people need, and then do a reconciliation of, of those needs and wants. You know, it's kind of one of the driving forces behind Rapids being created and really, um, you know, uh, shifting, some, you know, my weight and influence, at least on the performance side uh, of the industry for a while. Um, I've always been impressed by projects like Numba. Um, I think it's one of the most, uh, you know, spectacular underrated projects in the Python ecosystem for what it does. Um, and I also see uh, that you all, um, are, you know, building a, um, a kind of a Python native Wasm project, um, as well, that is, uh, rapidly growing, uh, influence and, uh, traction in the community. What are you excited about? What, what is the kind of, uh, that, that next project, uh, that you all are working on, or even that project that you've been working on for a long time that still kind of really excites you about its direction and its, uh, ability to move the ecosystem? Well, I, I certainly think PyScript is uh, is a really is a really big deal. Um, putting Python into the browser and increasing the number of people who can do uh, data analytics and who can ask questions, quantified questions about the world, um, that's been a dream of mine since I started the company ten years ago, and even prior to that. So it's the culmination of a long vision of what we wanted to do, but only in recent years has, you know, WebAssembly reached the level of maturity and become a standard that then all these other things are starting to happen. So over the next few years, I think we're going to see a explosion of things happening in WebAssembly. And I think it's going to really render the cost and the complexity of infrastructure management to be much, much lower. And this is kind of that first question you asked me about when you make things easier, what happens when you make these higher, you know, easier for people. And it's going to make it so much easier that I think we're going to see a sea change in terms of how many people are interested in building things and can build applications. So for me, that's a really big deal. Um, I, I like to, you know, trot out this metric. Uh, and this is really the motivation for why we make PyScript. Um, if you put all the web, all of the software developers and engineers in the world together and you count them all, it's still less than, you know, 1% of the population, maybe less than half a percent of the population. Um, and in a world we're moving to where literally every single thing is touched by data systems, information systems, every prediction, every grain of rice, every mortgage, every object, and every store shelf is essentially put there because of software algorithms. We need a world where it's more than one in a hundred 
right? Or one in 500 that know how any of it work. We need a world where it's everybody knows how it works. And so to do that, we have to make things dramatically simpler. And that's why I think, look, if you look at the world of why Python is becoming or is the most popular language, it's certainly the most popular teaching language. It's because we figured out a thing that fits in people's heads. It's easy enough. You can learn an afternoon. You have executable pseudocode. You can't go and build the next Instagram with it, but you can write some basic stuff. So if we have a language that has been now tried and true, people can learn it. Kids can learn it. And then we build all of the infrastructure we need to make so that they can start asking intelligent questions about the world and start understanding the world. That then is transformational. So that's the thing I'm really excited about. But it's building on top of a lot of these foundational technologies, right? And we don't have Numba running in the browser yet, but we absolutely want to get there, right? We want to get to a point where you can write this Python code and you don't have to apologize for if it's inside a loop or if it's vectorized or not. You don't know, you don't know anything about that. You're just writing a Python, some Python code, a little database query, and then it just runs at blazing speed. And you have no idea why or how, but it just works, right? That would be the dream. And I think we're actually within spitting distance of that. I'm really excited about that. But to do that, we need next generation smart data representation, next generation cross-platform, you know, unapologetically open and cross-platform standards for data access that is efficient and that allows people to do broad queries and broad ideation on on um, on large data sets, so that's why I'm so excited about all the work you guys are doing in Ultron. Thank you so much. Uh, I was just going to jokingly say, Peter, get out of my head. My my, my last <laughs> question: When will we see Numba uh, have a WebAssembly uh, connection? Uh, and, and that's exciting. Um, you know, obviously, there's a lot of uh, dependency issues when you start dealing with accelerators um, and yep. accelerated libraries um, that uh, still need to be worked out in the community for uh, for their use within WebAssembly. Uh, but I think we're closer uh, than people realize, and it's really exciting. Uh, we still have a long way to go with packaging, and I'm sure we could talk for That's another right. hour about packaging. And um, Yeah, well, and it comes down to actually a really interesting thing. I think hardware folks in general, the industry, I mean, there's no such thing as a small hardware startup that actually has scale, right? Any scale hardware company is a massive, big company. It's been around for a long time, manages billions or tens of billions of dollars of capital infrastructure. And so they have a very scarcity mindset, finite game mindset. Um, they'll do standards when they absolutely have to, but otherwise in general, it's just the law of the jungle. But in the open source world, we know what abundance mentality and open collaborations can lead to, and that can accelerate things. So I think there's an ecosystem dynamic where the open source people are going to have to have this hard, heart to heart conversation with the hardware folks about, look, there's a commons and the commons is the entire user base. And you can destroy it by building completely incompatible things and being very obscure about what it, what this is and what that setting is and all this other crap. Or y'all can just work together with us to build some standards so then all the users have get all the best performance of whatever hardware they're on. And that's better for everyone, right? So I try to have that conversation in my little ways with everyone when I when I sit down and chat with them. But it'll take it's a process. It'll take some time. Excellent. Peter, thank you again for uh, being with us uh, at the Data Thread. Uh, it's always amazing to hear you talk. I love hearing <laughs> how you think about the ecosystem, where it's going, uh, and how we can continue to improve it, uh, which is important. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me, Josh. Excellent. Um, that was an excellent panel session from Josh and Peter. Um, absolutely excited about the future of uh, Python and the future of uh, just in general, what people can do with the code and making it more accessible to the general public. And I think Apache Arrow is absolutely the base of how that can happen. And so great to be at this conference for that. Uh, next, we are going to have Sebastian Estevez, and Sebastian has spent most of his career in customer-facing technical roles for much of that at Datastax. He works there currently at Datastax and has helped users to choose, implement, and manage Cassandra and DSE clusters. Today, he works as an engineer um, on Datastax Cassandra backend database as a service offering uh, AstroDB. So welcome, Sebastian. He will be just talking to us um, for a few minutes. So thanks for the um, for the introduction there. I wanted to add a little bit more about myself. Um, 
I've been at, um, at Data Stacks about eight years, like in, like it was mentioned. And for those of you that aren't familiar, Data Stacks is um, the main vendor behind Apache Cassandra. Uh, we um, contribute to that project, and we have a database as a service offering called AstroDB that's built on Apache Cassandra and also Kubernetes. And um, one of the things that I had the privilege of doing is when we first launched the AstroDB service, uh, I became kind of the single point of contact for all the Astro users that, that, that we had, right? You can only do that with a, with a brand new service. Uh, and it didn't last very long as, as things started growing, but we were able to set up uh, a very tight feedback loop between um, the users and what they needed uh, and, and the types of workloads that they were, that they were uh, driving against the database and the engineering team that actually you know, built and ran uh, the database. And so um, we've been able to, to keep that going. It's something that I'm, that I'm pretty proud of. And I, and I, and I raised that because uh, the, the, the time that I've experienced, not only with, with the Astro users these days, but just the last you know, eight or so years of uh, helping out people with Cassandra, um, I can tell with, with, a, with a good amount of certainty that I think if we add a little bit of Arrow, uh, there's a lot of use cases and a lot of power that we can bring to users that, um, that they'll be able to take advantage of. And it really has a lot to do with some of the points that have been discussed today about ecosystem and, and everything that's, that's growing around the ecosystem around Arrow today. So this talk is about the possibilities. Um, DataStax and uh, Boltron Data are announcing a partnership, I think, today. And uh, this talk is about a little bit of, of a preview on what that partnership will, will include. Um, I don't usually do talks like, like, like these. I usually you know, build something and have lessons that I want to share. Uh, but in this case, we're being a little bit vulnerable and uh, putting out and, and talking about some use, like use cases and as well as features that we're looking to build uh, with Arrow. We're doing some experimenting already, but a lot of this is in the future. Um, and, uh, and the hope is that as folks that are in the same journey in the community, figuring out where to adopt Arrow and how to use it and how to interoperate with it, uh, that, that, that this stuff is useful for those reasons and for those folks, and, and we can get some good conversations going. Um, so I have a safe harbor statement here. If there's any uh, Cassandra or Astra users watching the presentation, that um, most of this is futures, and you shouldn't be making purchasing decisions on that. Um, OK, so in terms of the agenda, I want to talk a bit about what Cassandra is. Obviously, a lot of everybody here knows what Arrow is, but it'll help us frame why Cassandra and Arrow make sense together. Um, and then I want to get into target use cases and functionality that that we're experimenting with and building. So Apache Cassandra is a distributed NoSQL database, um, and it's optimized for for transactional workloads. Right. So we're in the business of putting and getting individual rows, uh, updating individual rows. Uh, at you know massive scale and uh, and and performance for uh, things that kind of drive tr transactional apps, um, and Cassandra does that with a focus on performance, scalability, and availability. Um, I mentioned here that we use a log structured merge for persistence, which will be relevant for some stuff I'm going to talk about later. Um, and Cassandra drives some of the biggest transactional apps in the world. Um, you know, that includes all your uh, you know iCloud uh, information for for, uh, for Apple users. Um, most of Netflix is back and, um, and a bunch of other uh, big shops like that, Instagram, et cetera. And so um, Apache Arrow, on the other hand, is a columnar, uh, I guess it started with a memory format, but also you know, it's becoming this big ecosystem. And it's designed for analytics. And so it, we're, um, uh, the, 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 column struct, the columnar structure in the nesting uh, allows users to uh, take advantage of uh, well, to actually manipulate lots of lots of columnar data and do things like uh, data crunching and aggregations, right? Um, it's real. I want. I want to make these. These are things that I like about Arrow. So, uh, I meant one of the interesting things is the zero copy data transfer capabilities, right? So, when you interact with Arrow, we're talking about byte buffers, uh, which don't change when we send the data over the wire, and so that allows us to do things like interoperability across languages um, and performance improvements from not doing serialization to serialization. Um, and so currently, in, in, you know, in the Cassandra stack, we do a lot of the serialization to serialization, and there's some opportunities there. Um, it's also optimized for vector processing, vectorized processing, and so um, we can take advantage of some of the lower level um, CPU um, SIMD capabilities 
as well as GPUs and coprocessors, which are becoming more and more important uh, in, in today's world. And like I mentioned before, one of the biggest things is the ecosystem. Uh, I call out Parquet here, compatibility. It's extremely easy to, to read a Parquet file into Arrow um, and, and the other way around. And, and that's, that's a very attractive uh, part, of, um, part, of, part of this because by, by using Arrow, we're really buying into this big um, you know, data analytics ecosystem for our users. So we're talking about a system, Cassandra on the left, that really deals with rows and it's transactional. And tooling and an ecosystem for data analytics. So, like, how 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 do these how do these even uh, aren't these ortho orthogonal technologies? And the answer is that what what ends up happening is once you have a lot of data in your transactional uh, system of record, you end up wanting to do more things with it, and that involves data science and reporting and all sorts of analytical tasks. And so, it, by using Arrow to kind of buy into the, the, the ecosystem, I think we can bring a lot of value to our users and that's kind of the broad vision. Uh, but when we talk about adding new functionality, um, I always believe that uh, the broad vision is important, but you really want a specific target use case to start with, kind of like the first pin in, in, in a bowling thing. And so um, for, that, for that case, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about what our kind of specific use case is uh, for starters, we're seeing a lot of Cassandra and uh, AstroDB being used for machine learning. And the main areas that it gets used for is to, as a feature store or even to serve up, or actually more, more frequently to serve up the actual predictions um, that users interact with when, when they deal with uh, the results of a machine learning algorithm. Um, Uber put out a, a machine learning feature store framework called Michel Angelo. Um, and then that team went out and built an open source tool called Feast, this is just one example, uh, but a lot of folks are kind of doing this themselves, right? They're uh, leveraging existing machine learning tools and then, you know, and then persisting uh, the features, the predictions, et cetera, in Cassandra and in AstroDB. And we have a few users uh, doing that right now on, on the cloud. And so um, there's, some, there's some pain points that I think we can address and, 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 and improve by using Arrow. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about what that look, what that classical machine learning with Cassandra use case looks like. Um, at the top, we have a process diagram where you do some some feature engineering data cleanup things, uh, then some model training and hyperparameter tuning, uh, and once those models are validated, they're scoring an inference so that the data can actually get leveraged by an end application. And so at the bottom, there's a little architecture of um, <laughs> a system where. The model is running, there's a data store for features, a data store for predictions, and the application that interacts with those. And what we're seeing is that that big fat arrow at the bottom, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a need to refresh the predictions more and more often. And that tends to be an operation that, that may actually impact kind of your entire data set. Um, and for is systems that are using Cassandra, their, their data sets are quite big and they have lots and lots of users. And so uh, refreshing that entire data set is becoming expensive. Uh, it's expensive for a few reasons. It's expensive in that uh, just to build a, a client system that can achieve the throughput that, they, that, that users need uh, to perform that refresh quickly um, requires a lot of work and knowledge about asynchronous programming and a lot of things that you know, folks talked about today about ease of use. Um, that, that can become quite challenging there. Um, and then at the same time, uh, those kind of bulk batch jobs themselves require folks that, run, that are running their own Cassandra clusters to scale them up uh, significantly just to match, just to be able to, to, to satisfy the, the, the SLAs for the bulk load. Whereas um, a lot of the time, maybe those, those systems and that hardware can, st can sit idle um, because their, their, their application-driven workload is, is not as heavy. Um, so, so things are expensive in both of those reasons. Um, I take a, I'm going to take a break here to talk about AstroDB, because if you're using AstroDB as your system of record, you're not managing Cassandra yourself, but uh, you do pay us per operation. And so um, it can also get expensive if they're writing, if we build like per million operations. Uh, and that's kind of the bigger chunk of folks' bill and folks' uh, expense for the database. And so being able to reduce that and, and making it more efficient um, is, is, a, is an attractive offer. Um, so AstroDB is our serverless uh, offering built on Cassandra and Kubernetes. And some of the differences, um, like we've, we've, made, we've made some changes to, 
to be able to run Cassandra more efficiently uh, at scale in the cloud in, in a multi-tenant uh, environment. And so we do that by, well, a few different things. Cassandra um, is a peer-to-peer -peer system where all nodes basically do everything. And so you can send a read or write uh, any operation against any node and they go figure out who owns the data and take care of everything from coordination to, to, to compacting the LSM uh, to actually pulling the data and persisting it. Um, and so we break those services apart and scale them independently and run them in Kubernetes uh, and scale them up and down with operators. And that uh, gives us a lot of efficiencies that, um, that we don't get with kind of the standard monolithic Cassandra. Um, we also leverage some cloud native capabilities that were here 10 years ago when Cassandra, 12 years ago, I say, I want to say when Cassandra kind of became a thing. Uh, things like S3 and object, object stores, uh, things like um, a central etcd, which we leverage for consistent schema and topology changes. Um, and then we also have some additional, uh, we, we have additional front doors to, to access the database. So this includes APIs like REST and GraphQL and gRPC APIs via a, an open source project that, uh, that we uh, run called Stargate IO. Um, and there's some room potentially to, to have kind of an arrow flight endpoint there. So that's you know, one of the list of things, that, of things that might be interesting. So in this slide, and this kind of t helps us tie back to the machine learning use case, um, the diagram on the top left is the way we tend to draw a Cassandra cluster with everything being the same. Um, and on the right is the broken up services for, uh, for AstroDB internals. Uh, but at the end of the day, whether you're looking at a data service in Astro or you're using your own Cassandra, uh, the, the right path looks like the bottom left, which is data comes in via CQL uh, from a driver and it gets committed to a commit log for in, on disk for persistence and it gets written to a mem table, which eventually gets flushed when it fills up. So that's the LSM, the log structure merge. Uh, persistence. And uh, those files are called SS tables, um, which, uh, um, which is kind of the bit that, that, to cut to the chase, uh, is one of the things that we're considering for, uh, for using Arrow. So if we were able to help accelerate those big batch loads from the machine learning re reload scenarios, um, we could do a lot of good. And the way to do that, uh, that we're considering is taking Parquet files, reading them with Arrow, and then turning those into SS tables. So we currently have a, a proof of concept um, around this that might turn into a production offering uh, at some point in which users would be able to share with our cloud offering their uh, permissions to their S3 bucket to read uh, and let us know when, when new files come in. And we can just immediately uh, tra transform them into the uh, Cassandra in, uh, on disk foot, on, on disk um, representation using Arrow, and um, basically load them right into the database, um, and so that it gives us some that that, that would avoid all of the overhead that a regular uh, database query has to do, including you know everything like from query parsing to to coordination to all the other things that that we have to do. Um, When we talk about this machine learning use case, um, I think I, I mentioned that things are kind of getting faster. And so in the, in the process diagram I talked about, we have the model that in my mind represents kind of your view of the world and you have scoring and inference, which is kind of your knowledge about the users or the things that you're training them, that, that, that you're uh, predicting from the model against. So if we, if we take a, a scenario like predicting the next uh, thing I need to, I want to buy in my shopping cart, uh, all the interactions that I have with with a system, or with a, with an application, like other things in my cart and things I've previously bought, are constantly changing, and so that makes a really good case for for scoring more frequently to get more accurate predictions. Uh, but there's also some use cases where we really want to train more frequently too. So there's a there's a Stanford professor, her name's uh, Chip Wynn, who uh, whose tweets I have here on the left. Uh, she. She, she makes a really good case for the reasons for and the trends for uh, machine learning going real time. Um, and whether or not you subscribe to like all the details of this, the different stages uh, of, of real time machine learning models that she breaks things into uh, and how to get from one to the next, um, I think it's a, you can make a pretty good case that these things are only getting faster. And so um, this brings up the, another service that we more recently GA'd, which is uh, 
Uh, basically, a, a Kafka competitor, um, Astro Streaming is, is powered by Apache Pulsar, which is a, a Kafka competitor. And so that will allow us to have architectures like this one where um, machine learning is event driven. And so as the interactions between the user uh, occur, we can start driving new features and new predictions and do things like real time training and real time scoring. Um, so in terms of Arrow, there's also some capabilities, some, some possibilities to, um, uh, to, to improve things here, um, especially, especially maybe in streaming transformations or also uh, in terms of RPC and reducing serialization, deserialization when, uh, when we go between the database and the event stream. So those, that's also an area that we're investigating. Uh, this is a little bit less, less big than the other, than the other use case. Uh, but yeah, so, and then if we go back to the broad vision, yeah. we're really talking about trying to buy Cassandra users or take it into this greater data, data analytics ecosystem that's growing up around Arrow. Um, and so there may be a case for read acceleration too. So last summer, uh, this, I want to bring up my uh, colleague, Alex Kai. Um, speaking of young open source contributors, um, <laughs> Alex, uh, I just graduated high school when he did this work. So he, he built SS table to arrow, which was released uh, as alpha in 2021. And we did some blog posts with, with NVIDIA. Basically the capability that this brings is if you have a Cassandra cluster with SS tables, you can take a snapshot of those. And if you're willing to get your hands a little dirty, um, you can basically read them, manipulate them, uh, data crunch them with, with GPUs via NVIDIA Rapids or, uh, or with pandas and I, with pandas and IBIS. Or different, or different tools in the analytics space. Um, and our hope is to kind of clean up this, uh, um, this capability to a more production level integration where maybe we use SS table to arrow to offer kind of snapshots of parquet in parquet in a bucket of what's, of what's in your transactional store. And so you could take us, and so you could do analytics based on a snapshot of that data or potentially also include more recently stored data, um, if we were to write maybe a, a, a tool that, 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 that converted either CDC logs or, a, or, or, our, or Cassandra commit logs into Arrow, then we could start talking about real-time read acceleration too. Um, so in summary, there's really a lot of potential, even for, uh, even for somebody that's, not, that, that's in the online transactional space, um, to plug into this growing ecosystem that's, that's growing up around, around Apache Arrow. And we're really excited to knock over that first bowling pin with bulk write acceleration. And maybe we can do a, um, you know, another session like this one with more details as that actually gets closer to, to being, to being available. Um, big thanks to uh, the folks over at Voltron who are uh, helping make all this stuff possible. Thank you so much, Sebastian, for that talk. I am uh, very interested in the analytics part of that and particularly interested with like the connection with the Rapids project and IBIS. Very, very cool work happening there and with Cassandra in general. So hope you all enjoyed that talk. Um, we will actually next be moving uh, on to our uh, speakers panel. So uh, all of the speakers that have been with us throughout the day today uh, will actually be answering any questions that you have. And uh, we actually have a chat feature. We have a question and answer feature that you can submit a question um, in that uh, little chat. So uh, if you have any questions that you would like uh, any of the speakers to answer, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A um, box chat thing <laughs> that you should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. Um, and we will be able to uh, have the panelists answer that those questions. Another reminder again, just to uh, remind you to be tweeting or sharing your thoughts on the conference, uh, go ahead and use the hashtag, the data thread, or you can follow the hashtag and see who else is watching the conference. Um, so I am gonna go ahead and hand it over to Morgan Mallock, who is a director of product strategy here at Ultron Data as well. Um, so Morgan, you can take it away. Thank you so much, Marlene. Um, and thank you all for joining us again, really on behalf of Voltron Data. Um, we very much appreciate you all being here with us. Um, 
For me so far today, it's been really exciting to see some of the core themes of collaboration and of community come up in each session we've had so far. Um, so here we'll dive into Q&A, where you'll get a chance to ask questions of our esteemed panelists that we've been lucky to have join us. Um, so please, as Marlene mentioned, put questions in the Q&A and the chat, um, and I will read them aloud to the panelists. Um, so we will start with our keynote, our first panel, um, with a question for Jacques. So you mentioned that the Apache Calcite project in your talk was a little bit like, like Switzerland in that it brings together people across organizations and is neutral. How has Calcite achieved such a breadth of collaboration and contributors and what takeaways can we derive from Calcite? Yeah, well, I think, you know, a lot of, uh, I think the original success there comes from Julian Hyde's work um, to um, really put the project ahead of other interests. And I think that that's really um, a core thing that happens in the most successful projects is, is the people involved in these open source projects, um, they think of them, um, I don't know if it's like a child or like a second job, um, but what, what makes projects like um, Calcite or Arrow successful, I think at the core, is, is that you have these people who um, think first about the project as opposed to themselves. Um, and that's, you know, in the Apache Foundation, those are typically called um, um, project, man uh, project Management Committee, people, PMCs. Um, uh, but they really are trying to think about how do you make a project healthy and successful? I think that that's the first thing. And so having someone who's really, having a group of people who are really thinking about that is critical. I think that, that on top of that, the other thing that um, is very critical one of the places where I think open source does very well is in uh, the library space. Um, and uh, the reason is, is that it means a much, much larger group of people can interact with those technologies. And so it doesn't mean that open source can't be successful in other ways, right? And so we had you know, some people talking about Cassandra earlier, very successful open source project, but it's much more of a service um, and it competes with a lot of other technologies more so. Um, and so um, what happens in, in the library space is, is that I think that you find that there's less competition. Um, and so then there's more opportunity for people to work together. Um, so that's part of it is, is being in a space where people feel like, hey, I can work on this and I'm not giving up differentiated technology or something like that. Um, I think the other thing that worked really well in the, in the, in the CalSA community was something that we spent a lot of time talking about early on in the Aero community was that um, uh, Julian especially and others as well um, did a good job of prototyping different ways to use those libraries um, so that when someone came along and had a need, they didn't have to put all the pieces together to understand how they can use this technology. Um, and so even though maybe the prototype was not sufficient for their, their full use case, they could get sort of a, a basic model of how it worked up and running very, very quickly. And that allowed them to be, I think, much more successful. And then they could then understand, oh, I need to make it, enhance it and add new features or, or use it differently. Um, but it's really these sort of um, uh, quick starts or, or basic tutorials. And that usually is a, a piece of sample code um, that people can model around. Like one of the interesting things that happened is that when I first started working with CalSide, it was not even called CalSide, it was called Optic. It was just a GitHub project. And it was really hard. Um, I think the, in the drill project, we were one of the first to actually try to actually integrate it and use it sort of as, as a new sort of separate library. And it was brutal. Um, we actually, you know, Julian, I think, did some consulting work with us just to help us get it done because he knew that code well from where his previous life. Um, and what happened was, this is that what I saw after that was is that because we had a working model of how it worked, um, what I saw is the next several integrations basically just lifted that model. And then they manipulated it and took it in different directions. Um, but the more you can have a working model of how to integrate with these things, especially complex things like say a query planner or like a compute kernel, um, the easier it is, I think, for people to sort of understand and therefore get more engaged in the project, find it useful. And that's really the model, I think, that the Apache Foundation and most open source projects have is that people are start as users. They find the, product, the project useful. They start using it. Um, and then they slowly move into sort of contributors and committers and whatnot. Um, but it is initially sort of self-interest. I, I need to solve a problem and I'd rather not have to write a bunch of code. I'd rather pick something up that already thought through a bunch of challenges. Um, so I think that those are some of the ways that I think Cal State did really well. But I think it starts with that sort of the, the people who are driving the project um, really having an interest to drive the project ahead of commercial interests. Um, and then building up sort of these samples and, and demos and, and whatnot so that people can um, more easily engage and use the project. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you for such a thorough answer there. And it goes back to kind of the core tenants we've been talking about community, collab collaboration, modularity, etc. cetera. Um, and so we've got questions rolling in here in the chat. So we're gonna try and get through a number of these. I see numerous questions kind of around hardware and basically asking, does is our processing power keeping pace with some of the innovations that we've discussed um, kind of on the infrastructure and software side? So one specific question, um, do we have the hardware to support the future of Aero? Um, so I would actually love to give this question to kind of everyone because I feel like all of everyone on these panels has had really interesting perspectives from kind of the HPC and storage um, and infrastructure layers. So anyone who wants to jump in on that one, feel free. I'll start since I was talking before. I don't want to dominate this though. Um, <laughs> um, I think that uh, to me, it's it's a... Uh, you know, like the, the two things built on top of each other. Um, so I was talking with a technology company yesterday um, that is pushing computational storage and really trying to think about how they can um, use the processing um, components inside of SSD or NVMe um, to, um, to drastically improve the performance of things. Um, and they're building everything on top of Arrow um, and um, that allows them to accelerate their development and sort of push this technology and this hardware um, to be more available to more people more, more quickly. Um, and so to me, it's like Arrow allows this to happen and then people are going to be more inventive in how they use hardware. And that will also drive more innovation in the hardware because there's more demand for innovative ways to use hardware. Um, so I think that it's probably the answer is, I guess the, 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 the very direct answer would be no. Um, but my perspective is, is, is that the two actually work very much in tandem. It's only when you have use cases that hardware can be profitable and people will make new kinds of hardware. Um, and so as you can push the envelope of how people can build use cases, you also see basically people investing in hardware and, and are in hardware R&D um, to drive some really interesting new ways to work with hardware. Awesome. Thank you so much. Any takes from anyone else on the panel on that topic? I think Fernandez, open your hand up. Oh, go for yeah. it, Fernanda. So I, I spent a year working at a hardware company, actually three years total, if you include NVIDIA, and building special hardware is really hard. Um, it takes a lot of R&D and it takes a lot of investment and they're, you know, without an ecosystem that exists for it, um, it ends up being rather useless. You have to have very specialized developers for it. Um, but we have plenty of hardware. I, I would posit that we have um, more than enough uh, performance to um, leverage hardware now, and there's a lot of performance left on the table. So I'm not sure that what we need right now is specialized hardware. I think what we need right now is um, to leverage the performance of what already exists out there and get more out of it. Great. Thank you. Um, so staying on this theme of kind of how is Arrow, how are these open source projects that we discussed affecting the broader ecosystem? Here's a great question um, around the deconstructed database and this idea of um, the question specifically is if Arrow and related projects end up implementing all of the core pieces needed to create a database, how would new databases or query engines differentiate and compete in the market? Um, so I think it's kind of trying to say we have all these open source pieces, if there are proprietary databases or new open source databases, like how do people either collaborate or compete with what Arrow is building? I, I love this, I love this yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 love, I love this question. I'm like, uh, it's an interesting question because it actually is, has been the history of like open source, uh, sorry, operating systems has the same thing, right? Like originally there was competition for commercial operating systems. And at some point it became something where everybody's just using Linux. And yeah, so a bunch of people were paying Red Hat for that. Um, but like um, it shifted things and the world changed and it isn't like everybody's, I mean, there aren't a lot of new operating systems people are building today. Um, people are doing innovations at higher levels. And I think the thing, same thing is true here is, is, is that what happens is, is that as the lower layers, I think app servers is another example that's sort of in between there, right? Where, you know, um, you know 15, 20 years ago, app servers was a big market. There were, there were giant software companies that were just focused on selling app servers. And pretty much everything there has sort of moved towards sort of these uh, componentized open source approaches to app servers. Um, and so I think that the same thing will happen um, at the the arrow layer, uh, sorry, the database layer as well, 
is, is that we're going to see um, uh, the commoditization of um, uh, sort of the, the sort of the basics of what a database is. Um, and I think we already see that in a lot of things with Postgres has honestly been doing this for years, right? Um, and so it doesn't mean that there aren't other things that compete with Postgres, but Postgres is, you know, a really good thing that a lot of people use, um, but then they innovate in new ways, right? And so like, you know, most of the cloud vendors now have their own distributed versions of Postgres um, that are, have unique properties way beyond sort of the, the, the basics of like, hey, joins and inserts and deletes and, and those kinds of things. And so um, I think that what happens is just the innovation moves um, and the competition moves and it moves um, to higher levels of abstraction. Um, uh, and so I think that's a good thing because it means that we have a lot of new kinds of innovation as opposed to just people building the same thing over and over again. Awesome, Fernanda. I would like to turn that question around and ask, I don't know how database, monolithic database companies will continue to survive in an ecosystem with the accelerators. I just don't know how they can do it. They're not gonna be able to keep up with all of the number of accelerators that are coming on board, um, all of the chiplets that are coming on board, you're going to have to decouple uh, these bits uh, from your database and um, leveraging other people's work. And that, you know, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to survive. Well, I think I, the thing I would add to that, I think it's a really good point. I think that the thing that's interesting about that point is, is that the shift towards SaaS and infrastructure as a service actually all of a sudden means that what was a monolithic database is no longer the case. Like we just heard about when they're talking about Cassandra, right? It's actually a bunch of components working together in a, in a service architecture. Um, and so what you see more and more is, is that these, these things that we have historically thought of as monolithic databases actually do use these components to build their stuff. And an example of this is, right, is, is that Snowflake exposes Arrow at, at various layers of their stack, right? So they're using Arrow internally. Um, and so they expose it as a product um, but a lot of the stuff that's inside of that stuff is going to be stuff that's being built in this open source, in these open source communities. Thank you both. Um, any other takes on that specific topic? All right. Well, we will move to another question on another hot topic of data mesh. So Chris asks, has the emerging data mesh paradigm come up yet? Um, Arrow was the first thing he thought of when he kind of came across the concept as it relates to high performance delivery of published analytic data sets with well-defined schema. Um, so I don't know if anyone on the panel has any thoughts on kind of how data mesh informs our work on Arrow, our work on kind of core infrastructure, um, but would love to hear any thoughts on that. Go ahead, Jock. I guess I'm gonna be talking a lot. Uh, um, you know, data mesh is funny because um, you don't choose what things get named, right? You come up with ideas, you push forward ideas that you think are really good. And then at some point, some, somehow they get a label and often it happens from a, a gardener or a forester or something like that. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, a lot of the ideas behind data mesh, um, um, uh, line up a lot with all of the early ideas we had with Arrow and with flight specifically, like in the context, like, you know, one of the really sort of things that we're very excited about, and it took a long time to get there. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time on the early specification, but getting to something that like, like flight SQL, where all of a sudden you can actually think about things as analytical or, or, or data microservices, um, as a completely different paradigm than how we've traditionally thought about data processing and connecting data systems. Um, and so I think that we're, we're pushing the limits of what's possible there. And I think that actually data mesh is the very first, uh, way that we're, that those are getting converted into things that, um, you know, late, late majority and laggards in the market, um, are starting to adopt. Right. And that's how technology works is, is you get all this interesting innovation and then it takes years and decades for, um, the whole world to be able to take advantage of this stuff. Um, and so to me, data mesh just sort of. Is, is scratches the surface of what we think is actually possible. Amazing. That is very helpful in contextualizing kind of Arrow in this whole new world of data mesh and to your point on kind of things getting branded, I think um, it's, yeah, for me, I'm still trying to update my heuristic of like, okay, this is the world of infrastructure and data that I know. And like, this is what data mesh means for um, kind of my existing knowledge. So it's interesting to get your take, Jacques, thank you. Um, and I'd like to turn it over to Jim for a quick question. Um, on your guys' panel on HPC, 
there was a good amount of time spent talking about the format of data and how columnar data is really important in scientific computing, HPC. Um, so there was this comment that someone had made on the panel, there's an opportunity to connect the HPC ecosystem to the data science ecosystem through file formats. And I just wanted to dig into that a little bit more, kind of what are, we, what are your thoughts on the future of how that might look? Okay, um, actually, uh, <clears throat> so there's, uh, there's an opportunity here because um, the friction between moving between file formats, which becomes a, a, an even bigger thing as the data set sizes are large, because you've got a huge number of files on disk, and converting them to some other format it would be onerous. Um, the uh, record-oriented formats versus columnar formats makes a very big difference, because going between columnar formats, um, the, the buffers of data, the contiguous buffers of data, are essentially the same between all the different columnar formats. And what changes among them is the, uh, the, met the metadata, saying what those buffers mean. So um, whereas with uh, record-oriented formats in which bytes of data are interspersed between the different uh, uh, the fields that you're trying to get at, the conversion cost is much higher. So actually we, we're seeing something new here where uh, there's uh, a small number of uh, columnar formats that are coming online in the last you know, five-ish years, um, uh, they are, there's much lower barriers to adopt to uh, conversion among them, uh, in, in particular, even on-the-fly conversion. So if you've got a huge amount of data on disk, if it's in some columnar format, getting it to some other columnar format, you don't necessarily even need to copy the data. You know, you can often, you know, just translate the metadata uh, uh, on the fly, because that's a order one. Uh, uh, it doesn't scale with the size of the data set. Awesome. Thank you so much for kind of filling in some of the gaps I think some of us had there from that panel. Um, so Sebastian, I'd love to turn it over to you um, as well to dig into something you mentioned when you were chatting as well. So you uh, kind of your company is built on the value of an open data stack. I would love to know more about like what gets you excited about the open data stack. And then a secondary question, if you're interested in it as well as just kind of like the future of scalable database technology, kind of what does that look like? You talked a lot about things you were excited about in the talk, but specifically I would love to know what gets you excited there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I guess a, a lot of a lot of other something else is changing. Uh, I mean, we're talking about kind of the rise of cloud and 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 SaaS is becoming really really pervasive in how people interact with with data um, and um, across across companies. And so, uh, like folks are starting to use kind of this more commoditized like offering from a cloud vendor um, that isn't just compute necessarily, but also but also services. Uh, and so when it, when we talk about the open data stack, I mean we're talking about the ability to take advantage of that uh, you know variable cost serverless economic model, but still being able to do so uh, while running on software that is open source that you can see the code for, that you can run yourself if you want to, that you can run on one cloud or another, right? And so so we're so those we're so those are the like the ability to, to to actually you know leave and change your mind and some of the some of the kind of freedom uh, of of owning your data and, you, and that um, that you may give up if you go for kind of a proprietary offering that's run you know exclusively by a cloud vendor. Um, so so that's kind of where that where that message goes with the open data stack and and we talk about uh, the database part of that and we also talk about the data in motion streaming part of that uh, with uh, with Astro Streaming. Uh, yeah, and in terms of you know things that get me excited, uh, in addition to what I talked about today, um, uh, I think actually like this kind of goes back to one of the questions we were talking about before, which is you know taking a, taking a, being able to take advantage of more like I guess let's call them software primitives to improve to improve a solution. You know, with uh, with Astra Serverless, we really take advantage of. Uh, Pieces, pieces of, of like things that, that we can take for, for granted today with cloud native, like like object stores and uh, like being able to cluster something with Kubernetes and and and, and everything that, that that gives you in terms of 
aliveness and container management and orchestration um, that, that we didn't get, have before. And so like we're able to focus as a company and um, actually building a better database. Um, yeah, and so and so taking advantage of standards like Arrows is also very attractive to us uh, as a as a database company because we can focus on the pieces that make you know Cassandra uh, what it is and it's so special to users. Uh, and there's, uh, I mean, these days there's just such a wide a wide breadth of uh, different databases that that kind of tackle specific problems in, so kind of heterogeneously that um, there's just a, there's just a lot of room for a, for innovation at the API level and at the uh, storage performance level, um, you know, so that, that that having the standards just makes us be, be able to go faster. And so uh, those are things that get me excited, right? Is, is seeing seeing technology like Arrow that we can that we can in, in Kubernetes and that we can kind of build on and 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 improve the actual experience for our end users. Yeah, that's super interesting. It seems like another theme here is like as we create broader standards and as things become commoditized like we kind of fulfill that bottom level of the hierarchy of needs so we're freed up to innovate a little bit more on kind of some of the top layers of the stack so yeah um, you, really, I think, you have to buy into that like from a corporate perspective and i think maybe not a, there's some pushback in some organizations i'm sure uh, but uh, we definitely you know we see that uh, we see that open source in everything that we do yeah, yeah, no, I think that's an interesting like connecting thread too between you and many of the other talks we've had here today. Um, and so we probably have space here. Thank you, audience, for sticking with us but with <laughs> for this like rapid fire jumping around on these questions. But I think it's been super informative, at least for me. We probably have room here for a, another question or two. Um, and there's an interesting one, Jacques that asks, are there initiatives in or around the arrow and substrate ecosystems that focus on the semantics of data and transformations? Um, this person mentioned that they think that might be another missing fundamental. Um, that seems like it could link both arrow and substrate pretty well. Um, and they're just talking, they add some commentary around like, are there other projects working on this? So um, I would love to turn that to you if you have any insight there, Jacques. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it, you know, it's it would be helpful to get a little bit more sort of detail on exactly what they mean by the yeah. semantics of data. Like, I would say that, like, you know, in many ways, right? Like, Arrow is trying to represent what data is, and Substrate is trying to represent the transformation of that data. But that's kind of how they fit together. Um, and so, um, uh, if you're talking about sort of more like data literacy or understanding, um, there's actually some interesting things that have started to happen, um, uh, around understanding at very sort of the, the most rudimentary levels. And so, for example, there's a, there's a team at Microsoft that is exploring, um, uh, using substrate as a standardized format to, to extract lineage information to better understand how data is moving through different, um, transformations and systems. Um, uh, so I think that the goal is, is that, that we think that those two things together, um, uh, provide a lot of what I what I would traditionally think of as sort of like the semantics of, of the transformation. Um, and now I'd say that like you have to remember, right, that like if you look at Arrow in the first year or the first couple of years, right, it looked like it was just a, a, a format for, for in-memory data, like how you line up integers in, in memory, that kind of thing. Um, uh, but what you can see now is basically this very, very broad ecosystem of components working together. Um, and the goals with Substrate are much the same, which is, is that like you got to start out by having sort of a representation that's common. Um, but then there's some really interesting um, ways that you can sort of um, build on top of that um, and build as a community to really extend what is possible. Right. And so like as an example, one of the things that we hope to do with Substrate is we hope to um, introduce a, a common sort of way to express materialized views um, that can be shared across many systems. Systems, with all those systems having the same capabilities to be able to map those materialized views to, um, to um, other operations. So if imagine you create a materialized view, you create that thing and say, let's say Trino, um, uh, and then uh, later you want to do a, a PySpark job. Well, if it turns out the PySpark job and the way you've constructed the data frames can take advantage of that materialized view, of course it should use that materialized view. Um, and that is something that's not possible today because these systems kind of have their own um, world views. Um, but as you start to try to um, merge the understanding of the, the way that these different systems express their transformation logic, um, you can start to get to a place where you're like, okay, well, now that we have a common way to express this transformation logic, we can now start to, to do these other things like enrich these systems with, with materializations. Um, 
Uh, and there's there's really a wide variety of things. I was talking with a with a company recently who was thinking about um, trying to um, be an accelerator that takes over um, portions of of processing workloads. Um, and there's this question when you're an accelerator. Um, how you can express to these, you know, there are many different systems that you may be using at the top level um, to work with your data, um, but you want to use one of these accelerators. These accelerators only have a subset of capabilities and what they can do. They can't do every single operation that the general purpose system can do. Um, and so how do those systems communicate with each other to say, hey, I can do this subset of things and therefore push those kinds of operations into me, but not others, right? And so like for the, to make this more concrete for people, imagine a much, much more sophisticated version of S3 Select, if you're familiar with that, right? S3 Select is this Amazon technology that was built a number of years ago that allows you to say, hey, I'm going to push filtering of data down to the storage layer um, so that I don't have to draw all my parquet files back to um, to my system. And there are multiple different technologies that have been built since then that are much more built on top of Arrow that other vendors provide. Um, but they're historically kind of very constrained to a very small amount of com computation. Um, and so if you want to say, hey, let's do first level aggregations and maybe even fact to fact joins at the hardware level, at the storage level, um, that's a very powerful thing. But how you communicate that between systems that aren't being tightly coupled um, is, is a missing piece right now. And that's what we're hoping um, substrate can do. And then also the logic about making sure that you figure out what that underlying system can do and mapping down the, the, those specific operations. Um, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity there. So uh, keep in mind in general that that, that substrate is, 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 you know, seven years younger or six years younger than, than Arrow, um, but has um, some, some of the same sort of um, grandiose ideas long term. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for that explanation. And thank you so much to everyone who contributed to kind of um, the talk so far. Um, I think we'll pass it now to Marlene to take us into the next session, but thank you everyone who is be willing to um, engage in conversation here and take all of these questions. Um, all right, Marlene, over to you. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Morgan. And thank you to our speakers for the amazing answers. Um, we are coming to the end of, towards the end of our conference, but uh, next we will actually have a uh, some announcements from Rodrigo Ar Aramburu, who's the uh, Chief Product Officer here at Voltron Data. Um, so Rodrigo, if you would like to uh, go ahead. Yep, thanks Marlene. And thank you, Marlene, by the way, for staying on and burning the midnight oil because I know it's fairly late in Zimbabwe. So really appreciate that. Um, there's been a lot of themes that have been talked about right throughout the day across all these, all these different talks. But I think if we were to really sum it up to one word, standards, standards, standards has been, has been talked about quite a bit. And, and for me, standards really enable freedom right? It's been talked about in a bunch of different ways, the, the right to fork agency, the ability to switch systems out. And at Voltron Data, we're constantly thinking about ways to drive these standards in data analytics. So with our continued investment into the Aero ecosystem, we're increasing the interoperability of the world's premier data analysis technologies. That's why we launched enterprise support for Aero earlier this year to help enterprise organizations further integrate Aero into their business critical data systems without worry. We always knew this ecosystem would expand with more projects and standards in the service of a more modular and composable data stack. And that's why today I'm incredibly excited to announce that enterprise support, our enterprise support plan now includes IBIS. For anyone who's not familiar, it's been mentioned in a few different talks, but just to kind of further iterate, IBIS is a Pythonic data analysis API that's data engine agnostic or engine backend agnostic. And so by adopting IBIS, developers, data engineers, data scientists are able to write their analytics code once and then seamlessly migrate their data from one supported engine backend to another, accelerating the portability of their data analytics stack. The value of tools like IBIS is immense where no longer do teams have to manage or engage in massive rewrites, right, to execute on a new engine backend, they can merely update the connection information and the rest of their code will submit their query for execution. And so today IBIS supports 10 different backends and we're working hard to support even more, including the Aero C++ engine, Acero. So we want 
users of popular data frame libraries like Pandas to be able to do the same work with IBIS across me as many of these backends as possible, including Google BigQuery, ClickHouse, Heavy AI, formerly known as OmniSci, and many, many more. Currently, Voltron Data is the largest corporate contributor to IBIS, and by signing up for Voltron Data's enterprise support, subscribers can quickly gain support for operations they care about and integrate IBIS into their data analytics stack. So if you want to learn more about IBIS, there's an IBIS project spotlight here at the data thread. There's a bunch of talks about it, how to use it, what it's good for, et cetera. And I really, really urge you all to check those out when they go live, which I think they'll go live in not that long after the conference on YouTube. And yeah, thank you all so much for coming, checking out what we had to say about, you know, Aero, the data analytics world and ecosystem. And with that, I'm actually going to hand it off to Darren, who's going to announce some partnerships. Darren, are you there? So I'm here to talk about partnerships. I'm our CBO, uh, Chief Business Officer. I transitioned, interesting enough, to business a few years ago as a programmer, worked on Hadoop and similar distributed systems. Um, but what I wanted to go over before I start talking about our announcements is like, why do partnerships matter, right? We, we keep hearing about driving standards, right? This, this, is, this is a common theme across this conference. Um, Wes and Jacques talked about it, expanding community collaboration, right? That's also Josh was talking about, right? These the silos and this vendor lock-in. And then a big piece that continues on that is accelerating innovation. It's, we see so many frameworks and tools, especially this community, uh, new languages come along. So we really want to help drive the ability to leverage that moving forward. So today, I am very, very excited to announce uh, that we are working with the Velox team. Uh, it was originally incubated at Meta uh, in collaboration with ByteDance, Intel, and Ahana. They are integrated with Apache Arrow, but we're going to be extending that. Um, please visit their GitHub repository. I think it's, I wrote it down, Facebook incubator forward slash Velox. Uh, as Wes mentioned, it's a C, C++ columnar execution engine. Super excited. So if I know, I don't know if Pedro's on here, but he really helped us uh, with driving this forward. So thank you very much. Next, we have data stacks. So thank you, Sebastian, for presenting today. And then this one was awesome because it was Josh and Chet, uh, CEOs at, 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 you know, Chet, CEO at, at Data Stacks, and Josh, CEO of Voltron Data, that really came together. Again, driving standards, accelerating an ecosystem. So I'm really excited to announce that as well. Um, and then let me get out of this share real quick because I want to show you. They just went live, I think, this morning. So um, please take a look at our press releases that just came out. So we have the one on data stacks, it just hit the wire, and then the one with Velox, uh, the project created by Meta. So if you have time, please take a look at it. I'm like super excited about this. So please, please dig in. And thank you all so much. That's right. Thank you, Darren, for yeah. that. And lots of... Uh, really exciting partnerships coming up. Um, we have actually now reached the end, um, the end of our conference. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today um, for the Data Thread Conference. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, and like we mentioned before, like I mentioned before, there are over 40 uh, pre-recorded talks as well that are available on the data, on um, the YouTube channel or will be available in the coming days on the Voltron Data YouTube channel. And so you should be able, I think that there will be a, first of all, there will be a link in, there is a link in the chat <laughs> right now that you can go ahead and click on that link to be able to watch some of the pre-recorded talks that are available. Um, there are so many fantastic talks that have been uh, recorded that touch on a number of different areas of Apache Arrow. Um, so feel free to watch those. We will also uh, 
also encourage you to take, just keep an eye out on the uh, Voltron YouTube channel in general, because these talks as well that have been given during the live sessions will also be available on the Voltron Data YouTube channel in the coming days. So I, I thought all of the live sessions today were fantastic. And so if you want to rewatch those, which I will be doing myself, uh, just keep an eye out on our YouTube channel. Um, thank you so much to everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, that is the end of our conference. Thank you also to all of the speakers that have participated in our conference um, for the live speakers and also the speakers that have um, pre-recorded talks. And thank you to all, everyone that has been part of organizing this conference. We really hope that you'll be uh, continue to be involved in the community. I also wanted to say thank you to all of our partners um, during this conference and uh, for everyone that has supported over the past few uh, months <laughs> leading up to the, the conference as well. So thank you to our partners. Um, and thank you to you as attendees that have uh, been here at the conference. And I really hope you enjoyed it. Please feel free to share your thoughts on Twitter, uh, on LinkedIn, wherever that is, and uh, connect through the data thread hashtag, hashtag the data thread. Um, and that is all for our conference today. I hope you have a great rest of your day.